Good evening, the San Dimas City Council meeting to, for Tuesday, February 14th. Uh, we'll come to order. First off, happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Please rise for, and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. We uh, tonight we have a uh, very special recognition, and then we're also going to have uh, three presentations uh, following that. Um, we are fortunate in the city of San Dimas to have last year's president of the uh, Rose Bowl uh, with us. Didn't know that she was a, a neighbor in, the, in the, the city of San Dimas, but we found out that we were very fortunate and uh, I think most of us who watched the parade uh, uh, were very, very pleased that, that we had this going on. Even though only one of us really knew about it, and, and that was Eric McConnell, and he made it very clear uh, that we should be proud, and, and, and we are. So, to, whereas, whereas Amy Weinscott has been a volunteer member of the Tournament of Roses Association since 1992, and whereas being the first woman to chair the parade operations, she leads the organization as the fourth female president of the association and chairman of the board for the 2023 Pasadena Tournament of Roses. Whereas Amy Wadscott provided leadership for the 134th Rose Parade and the 109th Rose Bowl game on January the 2nd, 2023, stating, we turn the corner together, we share in the hope, beauty, and joy of what 2023 will bring. Therefore, I, Mayor Emmett G. Badar, Mayor Pro Tem John Ebner, Council Members Eric Nakano, Ryan Vienna, and Eric Weber, hereby recognize the volunteerism and the dedication of Amy Weinscott. In witness thereof, I, Mayor Emmett G. Badar, have hereon set my hand to cause the seal of the City of San Dimas to be affixed this 14th day of February 2023. Hey. Amy, could you join me at the podium? Chair also, who's probably given up a, a bit of his time for this <laughs> for this endeavor. Amy, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you, Mayor Bader, um, and to the City Council. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate this. Um, this is really special to be recognized by the City of San Dimas. Um, I grew up in a very small town in northern Wisconsin and moved out to California when I was 18. My husband Tim and I have uh, lived in San Dimas since 1996, um, raised our kids here. Kids went to school um, to Lone Hill Middle School and also San Dimas High School. So we're proud members, proud uh, citizens of the city of San Dimas. This is extremely special. Um, it is a, it, it's an incredible honor to be the president of the Tournament of Roses. We're an association made up of 935 volunteer members. This was my 30th parade. We actually have some other members that came here today, some volunteers um, from the tournament sitting in the back. And your very own John Lee is a volunteer member of the Pasadena Tournament of Roses Association, if you didn't know that. Um, so um, thank you again for this um, 
this recognition, it means a lot. This will have a, a, a great place in my home, um, in my office. And, uh, you know, I was kind of hoping for the key to the city. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, a, it's a small key. <laughs> But anyway, um, so happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Um, thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight we're going to have uh, three separate annual reports of activities of uh, three of the organizations that we have, the, the commissions. Uh, we are going to have the Public Safety Commission. We're then going to have the Golf Course Advisory Committee. And then we're going to have the Equestrian Commission. And we'll start off with Larry Gioni, the uh, chair of the uh, Public Safety Commission. Thank you and good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, City Manager. My name is Larry Gianoni. I'm the chair of the Public Safety Commission. And it's my honor this evening to present to you our annual report, which we have not been able to do for several uh, years because of the pandemic and a lot of other uh, just reasons we couldn't get it to you. So we're finally catching up and get my PowerPoint. John, are you doing this or? Thank you. So the Public Safety Commission comprises of five members that are appointed by the City Council, two members, uh, the City of San Dimas um, Sheriff Station Community Advisory Board. All of the Public Safety Commission uh, members volunteer their time to the City of San Dimas to make this a safer community. So what does the Public Safety Commission do? Our duties are to learn more about the city's public safety services, our police, fire, our volunteers like CERT, to advise the council on matters relating to the law enforcement, fire services, and other emergency services that are available to the city and to the council at their needs, to represent the citizens in relating public safety uh, concerns, programs, and future needs for the city. To consult with our professional staff here in the city to help develop our public safety programs and to enlist the community interest in these public safety programs. I highly recommend to the citizens and the people of the community that you attend our public safety commission meetings. Uh, they're held quarterly. They're an opportunity to meet uh, all of your public safety uh, personnel and get a one-on-one -on -one with some of the people that can answer your questions and, and maybe take some of your thoughts and concerns away. And uh, it's just a great place to have some dialogue uh, with your law enforcement and other public safety uh, community. And it's our job to work with the citizens, electric and appointed officials, and the staff to support of our, or to support our public safety personnel staff. So what have we done over the last uh, couple of years at our meetings? Um, we helped and talked about the San Dimas app, uh, which is in use today. Uh, we reviewed the banning of flavored tobacco in the community. Uh, we certainly talked a lot about the impacts of the gold line coming into the city, as well as homeless issues. And we supported our members at the Sheriff's Department and community with our national night out event that occurs every year. We also talked about crime statistics, crime prevention, crime trends that are occurring in the city along with the Sheriff's Department. We talked about traffic accidents. We uh, were advised on some of the high profile intersections in the city. Um, we talked about the use of flock cameras in the city for crime prevention. A lot of discussion on that. We uh, worked with the fire department on our higher fire zones, and we worked with them on fire prevention methods uh, and the needs of the city. So our commitment to the community and to the, the, uh, the council, 
The commissioners have uh, completed ethics training and Brown Act training, which we were behind on a little bit, so we're all brought up to speed there. And we've been a continual support system for the community events, such as the homeless count, business meetings, and neighborhood watch meetings that are put on in the community. So I'd like to thank the City Council for your support in our mission to keep San Dimas safe. And I'd like to thank all of the commission members, some are, who are here with me tonight, uh, who have volunteered their time to make uh, this a safer community. Um, we will be uh, terming out a lot of the uh, commission members this uh, coming year, and it's been a, I am one of them that will be leaving. It's been an absolute uh, privilege and opportunity to work on the commission and to chair the commission in the last couple of years. So at this time, I would uh, like to turn it over to a great supporter of the commission and a great partner who's always been there to work with us, and that's Captain Ash of the Sheriff's Department. I'll be reading off of my notes because I forgot my uh, presentation here. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Giannone, for uh, uh, being part of the commission. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, my name is uh, Walid Ashrafni. I'm the captain of San Dimas Station. You guys know me, but maybe some of the public, <laughs> they don't know me, so I wanted to introduce myself. As Larry indicated, uh, we work very closely with city staff, the public safety commissioners, and many community members uh, to enhance the safety of the community here in San Dimas. Our efforts, cons our efforts consist of enforcement, and educating our community members to ensure that we prevent the crimes from occurring. Uh, let me just be really clear. The city of San Diego is, is a very safe place to live. It's safer than many other cities around us. The safety of our community and its members is our number one priority. During 2022, uh, we saw a slight increase in crime, uh, approximately 5% from the previous year in 2021. There are a few areas like larcenies that we are paying close attention to and are implementing strategies to ensure we mitigate those spikes. When crimes do spike, utilizing our uh, crime analyst, we analyze data, immediately formulate enforcement strategies, allocate resources in conjunction and discussion with the city manager, and implement those strategies to mitigate crimes. And then we assess our outcomes to see if those strategies were um, effective. Some of the concerns raised by residents in San Dimas include traffic enforcement, speeding, homelessness, larcenies, narcotic activity, mail theft, and burglaries. Be assured that we allocate a lot of resources to mitigate those concerns that the community members have. One of our top priorities is to educate our community members to prevent crimes from occurring. We call it hardening the target. We want to prevent crimes from occurring, you know, make sure that we put away our valuables from our cars, uh, you know, make sure there's great, good lighting in our properties. So. That type of uh, education goes a long way to ensure that the criminals look for another target and don't target our community members. We uh, engage with our community uh, to include wor working with numerous gr groups um, and stakeholders. Some of those groups are uh, block clubs, HOA members, neighborhood watch groups, San Dimas watch groups, uh, we have a quarterly meeting with all uh, majority of our business uh, owners. They're welcome to come and talk about some of the crimes that are affecting our business groups. Uh, we also have a community advisory council that we meet quarterly at, this, at the station. They're members of the public. They come and join us. They give us advice. We educate them on how to prevent the cri crimes and they take it back to their community members. We also work closely with our public safety commissioners and all those who attend the meetings. Uh, we also have a San Dimas Station Interfaith Clergy Council that we uh, meet with quarterly and engage with them to prevent crime. 
um, Chamber of Commerce. We work really closely with her and her staff. Um, and also, last but not least, we had a, just had a Citizens Academy, and we would like to build more relationships with numerous community members by hopefully they could join our community academy. That way they'll learn about crimes, they'll learn about the Sheriff's Department, how we fight crimes, and different strategies that we have and we implement. Last but not least, we work with our educators, Bunina Unified School District. Uh, currently, right now, we are working with them to provide active shooter training for all the campuses that are located in the city of San Dimas. Uh, so far, Lone Hill, Allen, and Schur has received that training. Tomorrow, we're going to hit uh, Xtrand. The day after, it's going to be Gladstone Elementary. Chaparral will be on March 3rd. San Dimas High School will be on May 3rd. Uh, the training is for all staff members because they are really responsible for our, uh, uh, the safety of our kids that go to school. So I think it's an important endeavor that we're undertaking uh, when it comes to that. We also are collaborating with the Unified, Bonita Unified School District with any issues that come up. So we're working with them really closely. Uh, we also have a very robust uh, volunteer program at San Dimas Station is compromised, compromised or comprised of 80 community members. Some of those members are uh, on the following groups, volunteers on patrol, station volunteers, explorers, mounted posse, disaster communication services, uniformed reserves, and mounted search and rescue. I'm encouraging all members of the public here in San Dimas to become involved in one of those groups because we all know a very involved community is a safe community. So we want to get our community members to get involved to make San Dimas safer than it is. In conclusion, I encourage all community members who are interested in public safety to attend the Public Safety Commission meetings, which is held here in City Hall. The next meeting is on March 21st, 2023 at 5 p.m. There, you get to sit down with us and talk about numerous things that are going on, be active. We have numerous people in the, in the audience today that are very active in, in San Dimas, and we encourage more people to become involved and work with the Sheriff's Department and our commissioners. Also, if you don't have time, you could always reach me or my staff at San Dimas Station by calling 909-450-2700, or just simply stop by or make an appointment with me. We'll sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk about any public uh, safety concerns that you might have. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Cam. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for, for the captain? Seeing none, thank you. All right, thank you. Now we'll have an annual report of, of the Golf Course Advisory Committee and due to give that report will be our Director of Parks and Rec, Scott Wasserman. Thank you, Council. Scott Wasserman, Director of Parks and Recreation. And I'm here to talk about the Golf Course Committee. Um, the Golf Course Committee is actually staffed by the mayor and a city council member, and also a city council member from the city of Laverne, and that's because of two, two of the holes in the golf course are actually in the city of Laverne. Um, and two members of the public, Don Green and Jesse Ash. And the two liaisons to the group are the city manager, Chris Constantine, and uh, me, the Parks and Rec Recreation Director. And the purpose of the, the commission is really, uh, we meet only four times a year. We meet quarterly. And our purpose is really to review all of the golf course operations, any upcoming projects, any maintenance issues. We talk about pricing um, of the golf course, a lot of different issues that come up. Um, the three biggest issues, probably the biggest of those would be the banquet center. Um, we spent a bit of time in the last year discussing the banquet center, reviewing the plans for the new banquet center. Council's probably, I'm sure, aware, uh, but for our viewers, the banquet center actually burned down in 2021. It's being rebuilt at no cost to the city. It's being paid by American Golf, uh, the contractor that operates the golf course. Um, but that's been high on our list, and to my understanding, the date of completion is still estimated as June 2023. So I was up there yesterday, it looks like there's some progress, so we'll keep our fingers crossed on that date. Um, another area that we dive into in all of our meetings, we discuss finances, we talk about um, various funds, we provide some of the balances, we talk about 
If there are any significant variations in those funds that reflect something operational, we discuss those. And in the last year, we've also done a great deal, have a great deal of discussion about fees and, and uh, well, fees at the golf course. So the, um, there was a consideration being given to actually taking a look at the fees at the golf course and increasing them. And the city manager and I, to that end, have engaged the city attorney to assist in developing a contract amendment that would essentially codify um, how the, what are the fees, how are they to be collected, and for the city's portion, exactly where does that go, and how would that be used. Um, so that's the purpose of the contract amendment, is to put all of that in writing, make sure everyone's on the same page. And at each of our meetings, we meet with golf course staff. They're very, very helpful, very cooperative. They share a lot of the numbers. They talk about their operations. Um, in a nutshell, we meet four times a year. That, that is essentially what we have discussed over the last, the past year. I'll Thank you. Any, any questions? I'm sure there's quite a few folks who didn't even know we owned a golf course. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Council. Thank you. And, all right, and now we'll have a, a report from Renee Cravens. She's the chairperson for the Equestrian Commission. Good evening, Mayor and Councilman. My name is Renee Craven. I'm the chair of the Commission of uh, the Equestrian Commission. Uh, we have the following, in the past year, we had the privilege of in giving input into the following areas, which was the evacuation, emergency plan for the um, equestrian center, the staff update on the uh, quarterly facility inspections, updates pertaining to conditions of the trails, which the trails are kept very well, thankfully, and then the consideration of rezoning the equestrian property that's located at East Baseline, which we all, you know, didn't approve of. And then last, we discussed the city's contract with the mobile welding maintained by the, um, by the uh, mobile welding, the rodeo arena. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Renee. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to oral communications. Members of the audience are invited to address the City Council on all, on all items on this agenda or not on this agenda. Public comment will not be taken during each individual and agenda item except for public hearings. Comments on public hearing items will be heard when that item is scheduled for discussion. Under the provisions of the Brown Act, the legislative body is prohibited from engaging in discussions on any item not appearing on the posted agenda. However, your concerns may be referred to a staff or set for discussion at a later date. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? Uh, the uh, first speaker is Melinda Matson from San Dimas High School. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. We are juniors and seniors from San Dimas High School. I'm Alana Matson. I'm Sophia Cabalfin. I'm Noah Berry. I'm Liam Luvand. We heard about the countertop pails and we were inspired by the Recycle Smart campaign. We think these pails can be really beneficial to San Dimas residents and we want to do our part in helping distribute them. We have been collaborating with Lauren Marshall, who has provided us with pails and the opportunity to pass them out to whoever wants them at San Dimas High School and Lone Hill Middle School. We have created a Google form for students and or parents to fill out as a means to organize who receives pails. We hope that if we are successful, we could expand our distribution efforts to other San Dimas residents. You may already be familiar with uh, the flyer that has been passed out to you already and is outside. Um, but it has a lot of useful information about what these pails are all about. The flyer was created by Sandy Miss Public Works staff, which has worked hard to spread the word about these pails. So thank you to them, and thank you all for listening. We hope for your support in the future. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Tony Aguilar is the next speaker. Mayor Bader and honorable council members, my name is Tony and I am the elected president of the Charter Oak Mobile Home Park Residents Committee. I come before you to refute allegations and misinformation generated by a resident of the park and share with you recent developments. I refer to an email correspondence you may have received dated January 11, 2023. It alleges that only four social events were held. There were in fact 38 social events held and they were the following. There were 10 movie night events, a 4th of July barbecue event, a luau event, a Veterans Day barbecue event, a Thanksgiving Day meal event, a Christmas tree lighting event, a holiday dinner event, six karaoke night events, 12 bunco events, two jar sale events, and two park cleanup events. The projector screen mentioned was purchased online. The karaoke computer was purchased from a wholesale karaoke retailer in the city of industry. Other electronic equipment used for events are my own. None were purchased at Home Depot. The only items purchased at Home Depot were double tape picture frame hangers to hang holiday wreaths and garland provided by Mr. Jeff Falco and your housing manager. The sign-in sheet issue, how much was spent and a number of residents in attendance at events is on face a ridiculous attempt to discredit the committee and its elected members who volunteer to provide quality events and work towards improving the quality of life for all residents at the park. Council members, an audit was conducted and every penny was spent and accounted for its intended use. Resident events. When someone requests an audit and infers possible misappropriation or forensic, forensic audit, you are alleging embezzlement and frankly slander, slandering honest people. Members of the council, the Residents Committee recently postponed its election as a courtesy to Mr. Del Falco to allow for a survey to be mailed to the residents as to what events they want and if they want the Residents Committee to handle the events or the on-site managers or a combination of the two working together. Currently, the committee is working with its on-site managers that they want to work with all residents of the park. Transitions are never easy. At our most recent residents committee, Committee, our treasurer and myself were rudely spoken to, or I should say bully. To be honest, I'm not sure what these folks want as they continue to spread misinformation, employ intimidation tactics, and display a lack of respect for others, including our on-site managers at the park. In closing, council members, there are many good caring people at Charter Oak Mobile Home Park. They want nothing more but to live in harmony have park improvements and attend events without provocation. And I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Greg with Mobile Home Park. Greg? Greg. Greg? I'm Greg Mutart. I'm not familiar to this council because this is the first time I've visited since coming to live here in 2008. My only comment is in regards to the transition between our previous management company and our new management company. The new management company did not receive the computers or any computer documentation showing what we paid in the past for properties so they're flying blind with no back, back records. There is a lot of misinformation regarding to who has what and what is what. Uh, the management company came in with a, well, we're going to raise your rates $75 a month for their storage space up where their RVs, which has been for, since 2008, has been only $35. And they're counting sheds, saying you only can have one shed on the property. When I've had two sheds since I moved in in 2008, they take no more space. The only cleaning they've done or maintenance they've done to the RV parking area 
so to speak, has been for uh, weeds. There's been no asphalt put down, no repairs made. The fence between the railroad and the property is so weak that in, about six months ago, we had people climbing over the fence and breaking into the sheds. I know, two of them were mine. I think there needs to be a better coordination between the old management company and the new company, giving them the documents and records that they need to perform adequate service for the whole park. Thank you. No, thank you, sir. Sylvia Melendez with San Dimas Chamber of Commerce. Hi there, my name is Sylvia Melendez. I'm the CEO of the San Dimas Chamber of Commerce. Uh, today I'm here to talk about the 2023 uh, Career Expo. It will be taking place on Tuesday, February the 28th from 3 to 5.30, and it will be at Life Pacific University. Uh, we have part-time and full-time positions, mock interviews, job search assistance, resume review. Uh, we have uh, resource downloads and more. We are still accepting uh, businesses if they're interested in participating. The event is free and open to the community. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Golden State Water, Waste Management, and Foothill Goldline. For more information, please contact the San Dimas Chamber of Commerce at info at San Dimas Chamber com or call 909-592-3818. I'd also um, like to mention we will be having another Business Watch meeting and details are coming soon. Please check our calendar for uh, upcoming updates. Um, I'd also, uh, lastly, would like to welcome some of our new chamber members. Uh, this month, we welcome uh, Benjamin Draperies, LLC, WC Construction Services, and Air Portago, LLC. Thank you very much. Evelyn Broadley with Charter Oak. My name is Evelyn Broadley, and I've lived in the Charter Oak Mobile Home Estates for 24 years. The new management company in five weeks have managed to bill in correctly in February, threaten us with a sign on our trash doors of a $75 fine, raise the rate to $100 a month if someone visits for over a month, and raise the RV storage rent to $75 a month. That's a $150 increase. Also, if it takes longer than 15 minutes to unload our cars, they will be told. All this is a financial hardship on many of the people who barely have enough money to pay their rent and eat. And due to the inflated cost of food and gas and everything else, I have lived here for 24 years. We have had other management companies and lots of managers, and not one has ever charged, changed the rules without a notice and a discussion with the homeowners. I can't believe they are putting this hardship on the back of old people. I thought the managers were here to serve us, not be dictators. After all, we pay their salaries. And do they really have the right to just change all of these increases? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Joyce Griffith with Charter Oak. Ooh. My name is Kathy Amstone, and I'm speaking on behalf of Joyce. She gave me a letter due to medical issues. She could not come tonight. I am writing this letter in response and protest to the proposed rent increase for the RV storage spaces at the north end of Charter Oak Mobile Home Estates. My husband and I pay $30 a month to rent one of those spaces for our truck as our driveway will not accommodate two vehicles. I understand that there has not been a rent increase for those spaces in many years. 
and agree that an in increase of some kind may be in order and appropriate. However, an increase of 150% to $75 per month is unwarranted and unreasonable. I do not understand how an increase of this magnitude could be legal, especially for this population. Even if it is legal, I don't understand how in good conscience anyone from the resident managers to the management company all the way to the mayor and could think that this much of an increase could be justified for fix, fixed income seniors. I would also like to know who at the city approved this increase. The residents of Charter Oak are, for the most part, elderly and on fixed income. Coming on the heels of the extremely high gas prices we have all experienced, this rent increase amount is exorbitant and will be a hardship for some or many will not be able to afford. For those who cannot afford this excessive increase, my husband and I included, where are we supposed to park the vehicles that are now in those spaces we currently rent? It almost feels as if the management of this park is gaslighting the residents. On the one hand, the resident managers have gone to some lengths to assure the residents that they want Charter Oak to be a place where residents feel a sense of community and where we can feel happy and safe. At the same time, we are hit with this excessive rent increase as well as the sign postage on the trash dumpster set threatening a $75 fine for putting the wrong items in the dumpster or for placing trash bags when the lid doesn't close properly. I have spoken to several residents who say they are feeling stressed and fearful about these new policies. This is the opposite of feeling happy and safe. This feels abusive. I hope that whoever was responsible for approving this unreasonable increase will take into consideration the population that this will affect and will reduce any rent increase to a reasonable and affordable amount. Thank you, Joyce Griffith. Thank you. B. Roche with Charter Oak. B. Roche prepared a statement, but she is recovering from an injury that occurred at the, at the park at Charter Oak where she required 50 stitches in her leg and she didn't feel well enough to come, so I told her I would read it for her. My comments relate to the new format of our rent statement, which includes utilities. The former rent statement was in dark print and you could easily understand the charges for the utilities. The previous month's charges were included so you could compare the previous month charges and the current month charges to ensure that you were not overcharged. The print on the new rent statement is in very light and in very small print. It is very difficult to read except for the amount which is written in large print and in bold. The new rent statement does not include the previous month charges, so you not, cannot compare. Also, there are abbreviations in the utilities charges that are not explained. We have no idea what those abbreviations mean, but we are just supposed to blindly pay them with no explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Manning. <laughs> Jeff, excuse me, Jeff. Do, do, do we have a policy that I'm missing? <laughs> uh, I don't think we have a policy. Usually anyone who's here in attendance can speak for three minutes. If somebody is not able to attend, they can of course send an email or a letter to the city council um, to give their public comments. Um, it's not generally the practice that someone can use their speaking time to speak for someone else. So I wouldn't want that to be abused or done too often. Um, so we can proceed. Right, well, at, well, we'll proceed at, at the current, you know, the process that we're doing right now. But I'm quite sure that the city council will discuss that with you at a later date. Okay. Kathy Amston with Charter Oak. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The new management company comes in with a heavy hand, imposing burdensome rules and financial penalties for the homeowners. Instead of dealing with the existing problems such as underage people living in the park and people that have 
stuff piled up in their spaces and carports that present a potential fire hazard to the entire park. Here's a rhetorical question for you. If there's a car parked in front of your house for more than 15 minutes, will the city have it towed? If a tar car is towed from our park, it's $265 and then a $65 charge per day for storage. If you have guests in your home and they stay more than 30 days, are you imposed a $100 fine by the city? I think not. Trash. If you put the wrong trash in your trash can, are you hit with a $75 fine? If your trash can lid doesn't shut properly, are you hit with another $75 fine? I think not. Rules change without proper structure or notice or input by the residents. There's been increases in the storage, as you heard, the RV storage of 150%. I've had a shed that I've paid $30 a month for the, since 2016. Now, I agree you could raise the rate, 25%, 30%, that would be reasonable, but 150%, that's not reasonable. Now they're saying not only can I, should I pay a higher amount for my shed, I need to move my shed. Where would you propose I move my shed? I'm 70 years old. I can't tear a shed down. I can't move it by myself. My children don't live in this state. Haven management rules were never adopted by the park. As they were leaving, they tried to impose, impose new rules on our park. They were not approved by the residents, and therefore they were not implemented. And yet John DeFalco is using those rules as his basis for the changes that he's making. Rents in January, um, didn't clear the banks until the end of the month. For many of our residents, that's a hardship because they pay their rent first and wait for that check to clear before they go out and buy food. And so our checks did not clear till the 25th of the month last month. This month, I got a bill where my gas rate went up 1,900%. There's a problem with the units of usage in my bill. For the last four years, my bill has averaged $13 a month. This month, my bill was almost $300. I gave a year's worth of rent receipts to the new management company for them to look at so they could factor my average and correct my bill. Today is the 14th of the month. I have not paid my rent because I do not have a corrected bill. This management team does not seem to know because they can't read the bill either. They're new to DeFalco. They were presented as experienced managers, and yet they can't even explain the bills to us, and they cannot correct the bills that are incorrect. And I'm not the only one that has not paid my rent this month. Thank you, Kathy. Betty Jean Lamb. I would like to give a big shout out to thank Jan Bartolo for recommending flop cameras when she was a member of our HOA board of directors. Without her input, the new board might never have taken her idea and run with it and implemented it without member approval. We are divided into old versus new and need to come together to work towards solutions for the common public good, not just for the few, the rich, and the powerful. It is getting to the point that people may get hurt or worse. I myself have been harassed, and a five-gallon leaking bucket of very flammable turpentine was left on my front porch. The divisiveness encouraged by a single councilman needs to stop. Via Verde Ridge is not the nice place to live it used to be. I think city councilmen should never play favorites and support one group over another. I agree with the mayor that it is not the city's place to interfere in an HOA's internal disputes, nor should it be individual councilmen's nor mayor's business to support a new HOA board over the old. Council needs to be neutral and has not been when it comes to the Via Verde Ridge Homeowners Association. It is the duty of the HOA's members to distinguish fact from fallacy, participate civilly in our democratic process, value differences of opinions, and vote accordingly. We are or should all be in this together for our mutual benefit. The new HOA Board of Directors decided they needed to maintain the trees in the city dedicated conservation open spaces, even though these trees are exempt from the city's tree maintenance requirements. The last information I have is that 20 trees were cut down and 54 trees were trimmed in a manner that damaged them. 
I think council's role should be to develop and implement public policies, review, revise, and update them as needed in a timely manner. And I hope council works towards those goals for our special protected rare black walnut groves. Individual trees are not considered rare, listed as 4.2. Groups of them that are found on the undeveloped hillsides in Via Verde Ridge are. Groups of walnut trees are called woodlands, groves, or forests. Walnut woodlands are CMPS listed 1B2, rare, threatened, endangered, and classified by CDFW as S3.2. It appears to me there are compelling reasons to review present policies and develop new ones now for walnut groves and conservation open spaces in our city. I think a balance needs to be found between preserving our natural open spaces and providing a defensible space around our homes to protect them from potential wildfires in our city's wildland urban interfaces. Perhaps a new wildland walnut forest category needs to be added to the city's community forest plan. Studying the issue for two to three months isn't good enough. The walnut trees continue to be butchered. The large main tree trunks have been cut off, leaving single flimsy branches with a few leaves. When in full leaf, these trees are fire retardant and should be left as is to preserve that function. Therefore, I am requesting council issue a moratorium now to stop the continued butchering and removal of these special walnut woodland trees. Thank you, Ms. Lamb. Nora Chen, Library Services. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, staff, and everyone. My name is Nora Chen, and I'm the manager of the St. Dimas Library. And just want to let everybody know that uh, free text forms now are available at the library for everyone. And we do also have free uh, COVID-19 testing kits for everyone. And starting next week uh, on Thursdays at 10 a.m., we are going to have a baby story time for babies for age zero to two. And on Fridays, at, also on at uh, 10 a.m., we have a Smarty Pants story time for kids uh, age two to five. And for uh, school age kids, uh, we do have a program tomorrow at 3 p.m. called uh, Fairy Fairy Tales. Our children librarian will read uh, kind of the fairy tale, the princess stories, including uh, Snowman and um, Cinderella. Uh, the white snow and uh, Cinderella. So, and we will uh, kind of uh, try the librarian will encourage kids to use their own independence thinking to rewrite their own stories. So, and all the participants will get uh, free books to choose. Okay, so I hope that everyone will come to the library and continue to use our library. Thank you. Thank you. Those are all the speaker cards, Mayor. Okay. Anyone else, else in the audience wishing to address the council? Paul, hang on, please. Good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council, staff, ladies and gentlemen of San Dimas. My name is James Shirley and I'm a resident of San Dimas and have lived in San Dimas for 23 years. And the question that I'd like to ask, and I'm sure it's on the minds of a lot of other people, especially the seniors, is that I know this has been an unusual winter for all of us, it's been extremely cold, but uh, the natural gas that uh, most of the citizens use here in the city of San Dimas has gone up exponentially. Uh, one of my neighbors, uh, that lives across from me told me that her gas bill went up to $600 and she's a senior on a fixed income. And I'm sure there's probably other seniors throughout the city of San Dimas and not only in San Dimas but in other cities where they're dealing with this uh, crisis. And uh, you know, it's pretty cold. Matter of fact, this is probably one of the coldest winters that uh, I can recall in the last uh, 23 years. But the question is, is there anything that can be done about this or what what has caused this you know uh, to where uh, the prices are just so high I mean we're dealing with the inflation we're dealing with the increase in food we're dealing with the increase in uh, uh, gas for our cars uh, the increase in rent uh, the increase in uh, a lot of other things and it's nobody's fault but uh, 
you know, we're looking to our leaders here for the city council. Is there anything that uh, the city council can do to address this? Is there any relief that's going to be coming for the coming months? We don't know how long this uh, cold spell is going to last. And um, the other thing I'd like to do is uh, change the subjects is thank the city council uh, for starting to work on the uh, potholes on um, uh, Via Verde. I had brought that up uh, last month and the city was true to its word, said that uh, when the weather improved, uh, they would start working on the streets and everybody can see the work that's going on. So I just want to thank the city council for that. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Shirley. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, are we able to give any update on the gas prices? Is that appropriate now or would we do that later under Chris's report? You know what, why don't we address it right now because people are here. Could, Chris, could you handle that? Oh, could you hold on just one moment, please, yes, sir? sir? Sure, I was going to address it in my update, but I think it's more apropos here since we have more in the audience, so thank you Thanks, for that. Uh, so natural gas prices, there's a variety of reasons why they increase so dramatically, in some cases triple for folks, and that's you know, an ungodly amount. In February, they dropped to a, about 65% from where they were before, and the CPUC has reported that they're expected to continue to drop and stabilize starting March 1st, uh, which is just here in the next two weeks. The, there's a California climate credit that's normally given in April, and that's being accelerated to March, and that's roughly about a 90 to $120 credit that you will see on your bill. In some cases, in previous years, you would see your bill completely be zero in that year because of those credits, but that's now being accelerated. The governor is also launching uh, or calling for the launch of a federal investigation into why the prices of gas are so high. Um, there's a uh, phone number folks can call that's a, uh, that provides free and confidential services to those who may be in need due, due to impacts related to the high prices. They can dial 211 for those services, or they can go to Southern California Edison's website and look at a number of different programs that are available to assist them in the high prices. However, what is being noted in the last CPUC meeting was that gas prices will still be higher than last year but not necessarily as high as they were in January. Chris, did you mean Southern California Gas Company's website? I'm sorry, Southern California Gas, thank you. Not the electric company, the gas company. We've given them enough hell lately, I think, the Edison. <laughs> well, now we're gonna give all of them hell. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Okay, Paul. Yeah, my name's Paul. I've been a resident at Charter Oak Mobile Home Estate for 17 years. And first off, I want to set the record state about the resident committee. Uh, Tony came up here and said that uh, they were elected. They were never elected. They were appointed by Haven Management. Now, as the city knows exactly what kind of management company Haven Management really was, they weren't very good. That's why they only lasted a year, what, 18 months. And you yourselves as the city told them they're done. They even left early and left us sitting high and dry. Now, next thing is like the rest statements you've heard. I've got copies of December and January. You can honestly see the difference. I think each and every one of you couldn't just look at these without going into a light. I went and asked the managers about these abbreviations. You know what I was told? They wanted to give me a phone number for me to call about them. What the hell are they? Seat warmers in there that can't do a job? And you might ask something. Oh, I, I ask. The city pays the Falco. The Falco pays the managers. Who in the heck do you think pays you? The homeowners of Charter Oak Mobile Home States. Let's get it right. Or like I said once before, get out of the seat because you've been in there too long and you're not doing your job. Thank you, Paul. Anyone else wishing to speak? Maddie? Good evening, happy Valentine's Day. 35, 354 days ago, 11 months, 20 days, I addressed the city council regarding problems with the management of Charter Oak. 
After, hearing, after learning that DeFalco management was hired, I didn't expect that there would be a need for me to ever appear here again regarding Charter Oak. However, that is not the case. In seven weeks, we have come to learn that the Davenports, who are new hires and have never worked for John DeFalco's company before, are not a good fit with Charter Oak. While they claim they have experience working in a senior park, their actions prove otherwise. You do not mark seniors who complain the print on a bill is too small and too light to read and tell them to get glasses. You do not tell seniors who have hearing problems that they are speaking too loud and be quiet. You do not tell residents to do the work that the on-site manager should be doing. Multiple residents have been called, told to call the building company to find out what the abbreviations are on the utilities bills, and that's their job. I had a meeting with Joe about this. I suggested she print a legend, and she just ignored me. She didn't tell me to call them, but I said you can't expect people to pay a bill when they don't know what they're paying for. Like many other residents, my February 1st statement had errors in the utilities. 13 days later, I still don't have a bill. On February 7th, 2nd, I asked Joe about the abbreviations, and she just ignored me and would not do anything about it. When the real rate of inflation is 39%, you do not unilaterally raise storage fees by 150%. DeFalco's rationale for this massive increase is that the monthly RV storage area fees were substantially lower and, than the fees charged by storage companies. I didn't know the city of San Dimas was running a storage facility. I'd like to see a copy of your business license for that. At a February 1st meeting, Joe called me a liar and said that DeFalco management was not conducting an audit of the $7,000 allocated to the city to Charter Oak for six events. When I stated that I had communications with Lily Flores regarding an audit, she said that was not true. I told her I had emails. She said, no, you don't. When I confronted her about it, she just ignored me. She didn't bother to apologize. Tell, calling someone a liar in front of 30 people and being asked about it the next day as I'm doing my walk, why I was called a liar, is slander. It's defamation. She's your employee. She has opened DeFalco and the city of San Dimas to a defamation lawsuit. The mobile home residency law has notice and meeting requirements. DeFalco is not complying with them. Thank, Thank you, Maddie. You. Anyone else wishing to speak to the council? Seeing we'll move on, to, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one motion unless a member of the city council requests a separate discussion. I'll move approval of the consent calendar. I'll second that, uh, but Mr. Mayor, I was wondering, uh, item number four, I think, is significant, and wondering if we could have that read uh, and then vote. And in the future, I would ask uh, for staff that maybe we could do this like some of the other ones uh, apart uh, from that. Okay. Any objection? Black History Month. Whereas Black History Month is an annual celebration of achievements by the black Americans and a time for recognizing the central role of the African American in U.S. history and whereas the observance affords a special opportunity to become more knowledgeable about black heritage and to honor the many black leaders who have contributed to the progress of our community, state, and nation and that whereas such knowledge can strengthen the understanding by all citizens regarding these issues of human rights, the great strides that have been made in the crusade to eliminate barriers of equality for minority groups and the continuing struggle against racial discrimination and poverty. And whereas February has been designated as National Black History Month and the city of San Davis calls upon all residents as well as others to observe and commemorate Black History Month and to rededicate themselves to creating a world where the rights and contributions of our all 
would be respected, acknowledged, and celebrated. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Emmett Badar, Mayor Pro Tem John Ebner, Council Members Eric Nakano, Ryan A. Vienna, and Eric Weber, do hereby proclaim February 2023 National Black History Month. In witness thereof, I, Mayor Emmett G. Badar, have hereon set my hand and caused the seal of the city of San Dimas to be affixed this 14th day of, of February 2023. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, we have a uh, motion and a second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5-0. Under other business, we have a consideration and discussion of the city to participate in the Heart of the Hills event on April 23rd, 2023. Uh, Parks and Rec Director Scott Wasserman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. I'm gonna actually give this presentation from right over here. Well, thank you, Council. I'm uh, Scott Wasserman, Director of Parks and Recreation, and I'm here to discuss the Heart of the Foothills event that is scheduled for Sunday, April 23rd, 2023. And a lot has changed since I wrote this staff report last week. So I'd like to walk you through some of the issues and some of the changes um, because we have some, some more alternatives for you to consider this evening. The Heart of the Foothills event is, uh, as you can see from the photo, this is actually, I actually found one that was taken in front of City Hall in San Dimas. This is Bonita Avenue. Um, this is, I believe it was previously called Cicla Via. People tend to understand what that event is. This isn't, doesn't have the same name, but it's a very similar event. It's an open street event, and it, it was conceived by the COG with the participating cities of San Dimas, um, Laverne, Pomona, and Claremont. And Could the you total. Can you explain what the COG is, please? Yes, I'm sorry, the Council of Governments, Thank San you. Gabriel Valley Council of Governments. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Uh, so, with that, uh, the total event has an, a budget of $625,000. $500,000 of that is provided by the Council of Governments and $125,000 is a matching requirement from the four cities. Collectively, that's from the four cities. Uh, the city of San Dimas will receive $25,000 from the council of governments to reimburse expenses for the participation in the event. And the city's matching requirement is $18,620, which we would anticipate um, reaching, if not exceeding that, prior to the day of the event, just from the event planning. Um, for the event, it's about a six and a half mile event. Um, obviously starts in San Dimas and goes all the way to Claremont, about six and a half miles away. And um, the Council of Governments actually provides volunteers to do a lot of the work, to pick up the trash, to assist riders, to assist with soft street closures. I'm certain they do a lot more than that. I didn't list everything. Um, the volunteers are actually recruited and trained by the Council of Governments and their consultant. And they show up on the day of the event and they actually report to um, staff with the Council of Government, not to city staff. And the event is intended to be cost neutral for participating cities. So I apologize this map looks so small up there, but the red line, that red line there represents the route that is proposed in San Dimas. It starts here. That is uh, San Dimas Canyon Road, a little east of that. And it goes up to Monte Vista, which is, I think, about right here. And when I wrote the staff report, it was really just considering that route all the way to Monte Vista. And in the report, I indicated that there would be an expense to the city after the reimbursement from the Council of Governments of $25,000 there would be an expense to the city of 
Well, we've had some really productive conversations with the COG or the Council of Governments, and I'm, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, this right here is City Hall. And if you notice on the red line, there's sort of a dotted black line here. This is an alternate route that we've discussed with the Council of Governments. And the distance that we eliminate here is actually made up if we count the linear feet here at the city's hub. And this is the, we call this the city's hub because that's where um, public works and parks and recreation will be conducting the annual Earth Day and Arbor Day event. Um, normally it's from 10 to 1, but we're going to have it go from 9 to 4 to coincide with the event, the Heart of the Foothills event. Um, also in the parking lot, we anticipate having a farmer's market and probably one stage with a band there that we're able to provide. Um, so, one of the reasons we like the shorter route, um, obviously it eliminates a lot of street closures here which means we can reduce staffing, which means it makes the event um, more affordable for the city of San Dimas. But also, we had concerns about this area. This is the Albertsons Shopping Center. And the purpose of the event is really to engage the downtown, um, you know, provide lo local businesses with, with folks that are going to come in and spend money. And with the proposed route going all the way to Monta Vista, that would have eliminated vehicular access to this shopping center except on San Dimas Canyon, I'm sorry, San Dimas Avenue here. So we had concerns about that. We know the business community expressed concerns about being closed uh, in 2018, the last time we had the event. So in our productive conversations with the COG or the Council of Governments, we discussed this alternative route here um, that we believe accomplishes quite a bit. It lowers our expenses, it's still acceptable to the Council of Governments and I think it just makes the, the, I'll show you what it does to the, uh, the price tag here in a second here. So we talked about the original route, whoops, excuse me, talked about the original route, that was to Monta Vista. The total cost to the city, our estimate would be $67,550. And I've included just a breakdown of the budgets here. The sheriff's budget would be 38216 Parks and Recreation, 20443 Public Works would be 33000 almost 34000 um, When we take into account the reimbursement from the Council of Governments, um, it still leaves a balance of 67550 that would have to be borne by the city of San Dimas. So hence, our conversations about the alternative route. Um, I, it is actually not a shorter route, that is a little deceptive, it's just a different route. And you can see what happens when we look at the different route here. The sheriff's budget goes down to 23,438. Parks and Recreation was cut almost in half to 5,875. Public Works goes down to 13,347. And when you account for the $25,000 reimbursement from the Council of Governments, the total cost to the city would be $17,660. Um, so that would, be the, that would be the route that we've been working on. We've been negotiating with the Council of Governments. That would be the route that staff would recommend. And for city council direction to staff, there are essentially three alternatives. Um, the first is basically authorize the city manager to negotiate the required changes to the traffic plan and the MOU using the alternative event route and staff would return at a future date to process a budget amendment to pay for uh, the cost of the event which would be anticipated around $17,660. Option two would be approve the MOU with the uh, San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments as is using the route that was presented, the original route, which would obligate the city to participate in the event at a net cost of $67,550. And of course, the third option available to council is um, you can, if you decide, you may reject the MOU with the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, would, which would prevent the city from participating in the event. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions that you have. Questions? Well, I applaud staff for working uh, hard with the COG. Um, and 
they, you know, as I asked them myself, well, I'm the delegate, as some people know, to the Council of Governments, but I asked uh, them myself, that they got that grant for $500,000, so that's their, their grant to them to put the event on, and I was wondering, you know, where that all went, because we have a chart that shows how much the cities of Pomona, Claremont, Laverne, and San Dimas were going to be reimbursed, and as you mentioned, San Dimas was at 25000 and the people that put it on, so the Heart of the Foothills was put on four years ago by Ciclavia. This year it's, uh, I don't know what it's. I believe it's Active San Gabriel Valley um, Consultant. Yeah, Active, yeah, SUV, whatever that SUV means. Um, and really the bulk of the money goes to that organization. I think it was something like, something like $290,000. Um, but I like the fact that you were able to, with those little um, Oops. Line, dotted lines Excuse on the me, I'm route. I'm sorry. Sorry, on the route there around Civic Center Park, adding back the amount of distance that we're taking away on the other part. Correct. Metro, which has to approve the whole plan, uh, the COG will submit it to to, the, to Metro. Um, bases that reimbursement of twenty five thousand dollars in San Dimas's case on the route that we're taking, and and how long it is. So it's it's because if it was going to be a lot shorter, we would get even less money from them. Um, so that was um, the only, I mean, one thing, I saw the invoice that we provided back in 2018, and it, and I'm wondering why the costs are so much higher this year. Um, and it might have been the accounting that was done, and maybe you can, but for example, the Sheriff's Department's reimbursable cost that we got was $12,000. And here we're talking about 38,000 for the original and 20 something uh, for the for the modified. Um, Parks and Rec was, I think, along those lines actually, around $5,000 or something like that last time. But this time it was a lot higher for the same route we did last four times four years ago. So, what accounts for that difference in in uh, dollars? That that's a great question. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to bring up. One of them is that in the report. Uh, the original report, your staff report, um, I noted that the total amount spent by the city was 123000 and that is technically true. The city, we got the same $25,000 reimbursement. Um, what was different is that in 2018, the city had the contract with the traffic engineers to develop the route, the engineering for the route, and because the city already had the contract, the COG uh, just reimburse the city for that expense, which is about $98,000. So the $98,000 plus the $25,000 is, is about $123,000. That's where that number came from. Um, but the second part of your question is, I don't believe we have ever really actually dived into what our actual costs are to support the event. Um, but you're correct. This year, the COG uh, Council of Governments is, they're doing a lot. Um, they're providing all the volunteers. Um, they're taking the traffic plan, they're paying for that, the cities don't have to do that, so it's a little bit different this year. Right. Right. And so you think that the increased amount, uh, not just inflation, but is there, was there a, 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 a new look at it to say, oh, we need more sheriff's personnel, for example, more staff time, perhaps? You know, I'll, I'll defer specific questions about the sheriff's budget and their staffing level um, to, to the sheriffs, but. I think the concern is just if we're having an event that, that could be attended by between 30 to 50,000 people, um, we want to we want to feel confident that we have control of the street, mm -hmm. and that and that you know that we know what's going on. We have control of the street. If something happens, we can act quickly. So I think that's where the, the staffing, the support staffing here comes in. And San Dimas is responsible for keeping the street open. So you know maybe we don't do the actual infrastructure of all the barricades and, and, and that, but we do need to keep it open. And so, I mean, I could totally understand the, Correct. the contribution we're making. The, the parks budget, um, that is mostly, I mentioned the hub. I talked about what's going to be happening here at Civic Center Park. Um, we'll have the Arbor Day and the Earth Day event. We'll also have the farmer's market and we'll have a ban. So that'll, that'll keep us very busy around here. But for example, in my budget, we, or parks budget, I should say, um, I didn't budget folks to be out on the street because I know that the Council of Government is going to provide volunteers for that part. And also, anything related to security, 
where street closures would really be probably better addressed by the sheriffs or public works. Um, but if you have other detailed questions about you know, the sheriff's budget or public works budget, we'd be happy to answer those questions. I appreciate it, thanks. Sure. You, you mentioned uh, farmer's market. Are we gonna have the regular farmer's market like we have every summer? That's correct. That, yeah, so that. they'll be out in the parking lot front and center uh, with Bonita Avenue and we'll have at least, we know that we're gonna have at least one band there with a stage at this time. Thank you. Scott, will this uh, negatively impact San Dimas residents' abilities to be able to attend our Arbor Day and Farmer's Market event? I don't believe so, because there still will be access to the park. That's a great question. I mean, I think it will be more challenging to figure out how to get there, but there is still, um, there is still access to the park where people can get there. It's always funny. Depends on which council member asks a question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I have some heartburn with this because I remember when we did it before, and it was supposed to be cost neutral to the city. And in this case, you know, reading the, the staff report and then talking to Chris a little bit about the developments that have come down, it takes me back to the ROI. Why? Why are we doing this? And even when I look at what this event's about, uh, I participated in the Ciclavia event and I rode the route down to Claremont and stopped at some of the places along the way. But even when you look at open streets, you know, and being the focus of this event and uh, all of that, I mean, we do open streets anytime we have our uh, holiday extravaganza event, essentially, and we do it uh, for almost any other community event, large community event that we do. I just, I wonder when I look at a total cost of $17,000 when I have a, a parks and rec center that needs attention, if that's not money better spent that will actually affirmatively impact the residents of San Dimas uh, rather than a regional party, you know, that's really around a street closure to let people take over the streets, you know, and I don't, I don't mean to diminish the event, but I think that open streets for the purposes of what the event is, um, you know, I, I looking at the parking restrictions even, I just, I, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not gonna enjoy getting to the Arbor Day event uh, and for the residents that are impacted around here for an event that is already established in a tradition in our city, I understand coupling it together. But I also don't think we have a, a similar downtown situation to some of these other participating cities. I think that Laverne, Claremont, you know, their, their downtowns are a lot more bustling. They're typically open. Um, and I just, I don't see that patronage occurring uh, to our businesses. In fact, I, I, I think in some instances it may even hinder uh, some of their operations to have that closure. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to be overly supportive of this if it's not cost neutral, period. Not, and, I, and I understand the, the commitment from staff and how that works on the in-kind matching, but as Chris and I were talking about it earlier that, you know, in-kind is great but you're still asking for essentially $17,660 that was not anticipated. Where's this money gonna come from? Where would we move this money from? Reserves to do this? Okay, all right, thank you. Just to follow up on what Ryan was saying, because it is a concern with the, uh, the streets being blocked off, and I'm not sure, Scott, if you or Sherry would be able to speak to this, but I'm looking at the uh, the details of the street closures in San Dimas. And you've got to remember that the, uh, the proposal you're talking about goes from um, Iglesia, Bonita is close from Iglesia to San Dimas Canyon and a little bit beyond, and that's where San Dimas ends. But I'm looking at this, uh, see, it's on, it's just on a, it's got a page number. You know, it doesn't have an agenda page number, but it's uh, page 80. Of, a, of an attachment that includes a bunch of maps, Exhibit B. And uh, it sh I think it shows from San Dimas Canyon to Walnut that only half of the street is blocked off. So it looks like the, west or the eastbound side is blocked off. It looks like the westbound is open to traffic going from San Dimas Avenue to Walnut, or San Dimas Canyon, San Dimas Canyon Road if I misspoke, San Dimas Canyon Road to Walnut. That Am is correct. Okay. 
And that, that is the same layout as, la as the last event in 2018. There are some apartment buildings um, and a, a church on that north side that uh, need to have continuous access. And so folks from that side of town can go that route, make a right turn on Walnut, and they're right here at Civic Center where all the activities that Ryan was talking about are. Um, so there, there is a little bit of blockage. Um, San Dimas Canyon at Road itself has what they call intermittent, so they've got some kind of traffic control where they'll be stopping all the cyclists, skateboarders, and everybody else from going so that cars can cross the street there. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And is that what the Sheriff's Department is doing a lot of, or is it volunteers from the... So it'll be the Sheriff's Department, and then we'll have uh, city staff there as well, and then they have volunteers from the... Uh, California Conservation Corps in uniform to help control the crowds. All right. Okay. Thank you. Did, did we actually uh, meet with the downtown business associations and talk to talk about this event? I remember, like Ryan does and and John, you know, three years ago or four years ago, it was pretty bustling there. I mean, it was pretty crowded, and the businesses were looked like they were doing good. But I, you know, it's hard for me to say. I looked at the restaurants, you know, Rodies and uh, and uh, Bazettos and stuff like that, and they all appeared to be doing, you know, pretty good business because it was blocked off. So I just was wondering, uh, but don't take this as a that I'm really in favor of sixty-seven thousand dollars because that it is not even close. But the reality is, I was just wondering if we took in the mind to talk to the downtown business associations and see what their mindset was. We actually, we actually did. So we actually did uh, a survey of the business owners, and this is the stretch that you're talking about, and a lot of them were, um, I think 15 people, was it 15? 15 responded, and I think most of them were in favor, I mean, they didn't have a problem shutting the street down for that event. But only, that was only 15 people. And typically when we close the streets, even if it's something for like uh, something established like the, the holiday extravaganza, opinions are split on that, on whether the street should be closed or it should be open. We also, whoops, I keep hitting the wrong button here. <laughs> we also uh, spoke to, um, we checked in with some folks in this, I want to hit the right button, <laughs> that shopping center here. So this is the Albertson Center. I learned that Sunday is their, generally their busiest busiest day of the week, and some of them did express concerns with being, you know, having vehicular access shut off for the duration of the event, but we did manage to facilitate vehicular ingress and egress uh, at Iglesia Street, and then also here on Sandiums Avenue. So we, we, we did reach out the best that we could. Well, I, I, I do know that uh, the uh car show last year the uh, was a real problem the, the management of of uh, of the Albertsons was very concerned about the fact that the uh, their ingress and egress was uh, actually they felt hampered and I don't I don't know what they're going to do at the next turn but the reality is it didn't sound like they were very favorable and now we're going to block off another event potential event for them and like you said Sunday is a b busy day for them and they are a, a San Dimas business and they're catering to San Dimas residents so that that that's a little bit of a concern I, in fact I'm, I don't know that it's a little bit I think it is a, a big concern because there's not only other businesses in there that are all affected uh, uh, the smaller ones and you know Dollar Tree and things like that they're all pretty doggone busy during a Sunday afternoon or Sunday. Yeah, I agree with you, Mayor. I heard an, a number that was a little over, well, it's over that number. Their loss, from what I understand, the last time was more than the cost that we would have to put up to make this thing happen. Could you show uh, the access to Albertsons with the modified plan, Sherry? So um, I don't. We don't have a map of that, but there, so Iglesia will be open. So that's the, the um, Iglesia will be open for, for access. So that will provide them that won't, at the, at the last um, event that was on Bonita, 
they actually closed that access point and that was what frustrated the um, the stores so much so um, we did meet with the uh, store owner or the store manager about and discussed with her about ha allowing access through Iglesia and um, they were or she was much more supportive um, uh, it, by by of the alternate route it, the uh, traditional route that's in red where all of Benita's close to the businesses to Monta Vista she was very much not supportive of so uh, sounds like in the original plan only one entrance would have been open that would have been the San Dimas Avenue entrance and you could only get into the parking lot going north and then you got to go north when you get out yeah. right. in Correct. the new plan three out of the four entrances will be open it sounds like Correct. Who's enforcing that to make sure that the people that are there are not attending that event and, in fact, patronizing those businesses? So that's, uh, we discussed that today. So that's um, a, a plan we'll have to work out with, since it's private property, we'll have to work it out with um, the manager of, of that development. Yeah, I could see parking be a big, big problem. It is. And especially for a market, because most people are going to, take their bicycles by hook or crook, and they're gonna park there, and they're gonna take off going right. eastbound, right. And, and at some point they're gonna get tired, and they're gonna turn around to come back, but how long is that gonna be before they're, you know, they're, their they're cars are in, the cars are either in the way? Because there are, you know, I know there are people here that went from here to Claremont, and then had dinner, and, came, and then they came up. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and then they got picked up and came back to get their car so that you know that in itself is, is a problem I don't know if if yeah. the management there I'm trying to be very supportive mm -hmm. but on the other hand I've heard enough of of some complaints and stuff for the fact that we keep blocking off you know mm -hmm. an access point for their business uh, I mean you know, I can tell you that the uh, send uh, the sheriff's boosters are actually looking at, at different ways, maybe half the street or something like that, to be able to get the parking lots, you know, access open and stuff like that. So there's a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't really aware about how much conversation there was until some of these things started coming up. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I do commend the staff for sitting down and talking with the COG and and uh, coming up with it looks like a financial resolution that we you know we might be able to live with but I'm starting to think about uh, I agree with Ryan uh, what is what are we at San Dimas getting you know the, our residents getting we're hampering their shopping we're hampering their you know movement um, and I and I don't see people drifting off westbound to get to our restaurants that you know, even though there's only three or four, you know, I don't see people drift in that away to, to get, get there. So I, I have some concerns. Mm -hmm. So, so right. I had a couple questions. The first is, uh, have the other cities that are participating approved participation in the event, or is that still pending? I believe Laverne is the only one that has not agreed upon the MOU. Okay. That they are. Um, and the, uh, the I, in terms of, I understand that rerouting the event leads to significant cost savings. Do you, in your opinion, is it of your mind that if participants in the event don't run by a lot of those businesses on Bonita, they may lose marketing exposure that could benefit them later? Uh, would there be some assessment of that in your mind? Because uh, they, would, they wouldn't see those businesses. Right. We, I mean, that is one of the drawbacks of this the, of this route. Um, it doesn't go yeah. to Monta Vista. However, when, when we reviewed this with the sheriff uh, in terms of um, what we could, you know, uh, the, the goal is a safe event for all, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, with a, the reconfiguration of San Dimas Avenue with the Gold Line, it it, it, it has a uh, complicated the closure of San Dimas Avenue at Bonita, that intersection, is it complicated that closure. 
um, to the point uh, where we feel that this is a much safer route, um, even though there is the disadvantage that we're not involving the businesses west of San Dimas Avenue. And that's, you know, in, in the years past, that was a very active area. However, um, there's safety considerations at this Benita San Dimas Avenue intersection and the fact that we're cutting off now, essentially cutting off um, the parking lot to the Albertson Center and the CVS Center, and then also we're cutting off pretty much access to the parking lot south of the, um, the, the businesses on Bonita, just west of Bonita. So it's in that triangular, the municipal lot right there. So one of the things that I did, because I was trying to assess the economic impact that this could have, positive or negative, uh, I built a financial model just to try to assess what the overall impact could be. And so I thought I would share some of the information from my model that could help maybe inform your decision in terms of what, in a conservative methodology, we would see in terms of economic impact over this year as well as a broader term. So on average, Ciclavia attracts about 50,000. It depends on which event it is, but the average is about 50,000. So that's the number that I started with, 50,000 visitors participating in the event. I assume that 90% of those visitors would be outside of San Dimas. They would be either from the neighboring cities or outside of the community entirely. So that gives us about 45,000 outside visitors. A lot of those people are going to be participating in the route, but a small portion of them would likely see the city and return later, uh, perhaps do shopping. So let's just say that it's about 15% of that 45,000. That would equate to 6,750 returning visitors maybe some, many of them probably have never visited San Dimas before, and they would likely come back. So when they come back, they're gonna maybe shop, they're gonna eat out. Let's just say that their average spend during that visit is about $100. So if we assume all of that, that would equate to a total economic benefit of $675,000. Now this does not take into account some of the losses that businesses would have of closures that day. However, a lot of those businesses are what we would consider essential businesses, so things like grocery stores, haircuts, that sort of a thing. Oftentimes what you see in that case is that people will defer their purchases rather than give them up entirely. Typically when they give up their purchase entirely, it'll be more for things like um, uh, discretionary spending, like going to see a movie that day. They may not come back and see a movie that that money is gone. So in terms of Albertsons, what we might see with them is they would likely have a drop. Many of those people might put off the shopping shop earlier but a large number would also probably go to Stater Brothers or some other neighboring grocery store if they insist on doing shopping that day. Now, if you assume that the number of visitors, so 6750 in 2023, let's just assume that 50% of them say they had a great time and they returned to San Dimas, and then the year after that, 50% of that number returns and so on and so forth for five years, that would equate to a total economic benefit of $1.3 million over a five-year period. So even when you look at the 67,550 investment, if we think about the, the domino effect that that would have at 67,550 over a five-year period equating to 1.3 and a conservative estimate, that's a pretty significant economic benefit left. So I wanted to put that out there. We could increase the numbers, we could decrease the numbers, and I could tell you what those are since I, I could plug them in pretty easily. But I tried to be conservative with this just to understand what we might see as a result of this payment for this event. So that would be five years, 1.3 million. Sherry, if we, if we moved the start to San Dimas Canyon Road and Bonita, it seems like that would solve the problem with the Albertsons and the events that the residents normally attend and still have it start in the city. And there's parking in that area. There's a shopping center there, uh, a business which was recently broken into again, unfortunately. Um, but what would that do? I imagine that would save a lot of money and probably make it totally cost neutral. It would definitely reduce our costs. I, I know there is some impact um, when you reduce the route as to the funds available from the CA or the Council of Governments. Mm -hmm. But would it be? within the means of the spirit of making it cost neutral? Or is it just not a cost neutral event as it's being, I guess, represented to be to a city? You know, it's not supposed to be cost neutral. Just 
to put it out there. So th here's, what, here's how the COG figures that out. They, they say that um, th they get a certain amount of money. In this case, they got 500000 They say that cities ha the cities involved have to, have to match. It can be in staff time and that kind of thing, but uh, it's 20%. So it has to be $125,000 is what they're saying it has to be this year. Now, they're asking the uh, cities to pony up, what, about 50000 total? I can't remember what it was, the total amount the cities are supposed to. There's a chart on one of the pages. Yeah. Um, it is 79000 for the four cities. Now, the cities are supposed to do 125000 The extra 46000 is being picked up by that organizing group, um, whatever they were called, the SUV group. Active SGV. Active S SUV, sorry. Um, so they're picking up the 46000 and then the rest gets divided. But D divided did you say the something earlier about $290,000 we were getting? That's how much SUV, active SUV is getting from the COG. Yeah. And of that, they're putting 46000 back, basically, to, and so that's, that, that's how that works. So, but, but it's not, but it never was supposed to be completely cost-free. Our staff time, the sheriff's time, you know, some of that is recovered. The $25,000 is what's recovered, and that's what we're talking about. How close to the $25,000 can we get? We were $67,000 away with the original route. Now we're $17,000 away. Um, so if we went to San Dimas Canyon Road and lived within our means of what the allotment was and did our match, why wouldn't we do that? Yeah, the, the allotment then would be reduced because it goes by how much the city's participating. So we've got a 1.1 mile route or, or something like that, and we have a hub. So those two things tell Metro, however they figure this out, Ryan, I'm not sure, they're worth $25,000. If I recall, though, we, didn't we, weren't we the ones actually carrying the agreement last time? I we, think we, we did, actually... Yeah, were, we were the lead group. Right, yeah. I mean, this is funny to me. So, I mean, basically, here's a chunk of money. Uh, yeah, it's not going to cover remotely close, it sounds like, to what you guys need to do. And then you can't back the route into the money we're willing to give you. So, I mean, realistically, I'm not understanding where this distance plays into the allotment of money if it can't pencil out they're imposing that and that's nuts yeah and it so if we started at San Dimas Canyon we'd have like a one-tenth of a mile route so they'd give us like fifty seven dollars and eighty seven cents well then they can start in Laverne I mean that's right. crazy that's to me because principally if we did that and San Dimas Canyon, Canyon Road in Bonita is enough to interface into Laverne to start the route. There's ample parking up and down San Dimas Canyon Road. It would not negatively impact the residents, nor would it negatively impact our event for residents in our city and allow some residents to participate in the event. So, I mean, if what you're saying is, is that Metro is bending cities over, because well, that's what it sounds like, to tie them to a route that they can't even afford, then that's nuts. I, and I don't even understand why we would support continuing to sport initiatives like this, regardless of the economic impact that Eric just talked about, because frankly, it, it doesn't pencil out. And we're gonna have to make a pull from reserves to cover an event that we could actually back into the allotment and match, and we are willing to match, and we have in fact matched, and we've done it in the past. So I don't think you're looking at a city that hasn't been a partner in this before with very little ROI. And even to Eric's numbers, I'd be fascinated to see what the economic numbers are after we participated in the last event to look at real data, if any of that hypothesis holds water. Because at the end of the day, you had a pandemic and you had things that were unforeseeable occur. And so while some of that may be true, I'd also be interested in crime stats related to this event, bringing in a lot of people from the outside. Nevertheless, it seems to me if we're going to make this event work we should do it in a way that pencils out for us but I'm one of five so I have a question for you uh, Scott I think this would probably be better geared towards you when uh, when we talk about the the second option that we've explored to kind of get some cost savings out of uh, out of the event um, you mentioned combining the Arbor Day event and that event is that in part is that part of the cost savings in that we're gonna have Parks and Rec staff here for both events anyways and they're kind of working as a hybrid of both 
my, my, the reason I ask is that my initial inclination uh, working large events like this is that uh, combining two events sometimes just doesn't work so well. And I mean, we've got a big enough city that we could maybe move the Arbor Day event up to Horse Thief Canyon Park or to Via Verde Park or something like that. Another area where the community can come gather and do the Arbor Day event, but it may incur additional staff time or costs. I don't know if that's part of the calculation. No, it's a good question. So um, typically we would hold this event on Saturday and it would be from 10 to one. So just, just three hours. Um, We basically, I, I think we're doing it on Sunday because we couldn't staff both Saturday and Sunday for the two separate events. We didn't want to cancel the Arbor Day Earth Day, so we just rolled it into this event. Okay. And that, that, that's a collaboration with Public Works. So Public Works, I think it's going to be all, all hands on deck on Sunday. So it, yeah precluded their participation on Saturday, so we just moved everything. Yeah, I, I, I do agree that I think it would be a big ask of city staff to, to do an event on both days of the weekend and then expect them to come in and work during the week, so. Um, but I appreciate the clarification. You know, I think just the way the conversation is going, Chris and Scott and Sherry, we, it sounds like some of the council and probably all of us would benefit from knowing the staff cost of any event we do. I mean, we obviously have a big budget for some of the bigger events like the Halloween um, you know, Spectacular and, and the Christmas or the holiday, uh, the Halloween um, Spectacular and the holiday extravaganza. But we have all sorts of other events, whether it's the, uh, you know, the 5K and the Fun Run, um, Arbor Day and Earth Day, as you said, the Family Festival, staffing the booths at Farmer's Market, just all these different things probably run into a little bit of planning and staff time. And so if it's the council's ask that we get numbers for all of those, it'd be interesting to know how much money we're spending on those, because then we could compare it to how much money we're spending on this to, to have the event happen. Frankly, I think that the $17,660 is worth it. Eric, how many people did you estimate might be from San Dimas that would participate? Actually when you look at it, I said 90% I said would be outside, but then I looked at the number and it would be unrealistic. So if you were to say that 90% of the 50,000 were outside of the city of San Dimas, what that would imply is that 5,000 residents from San Dimas would participate, which to me seems really high. Yeah. So I think a better number would be actually 99% of people would be up from outside of San Dimas because that would imply that of the 50,000, 500 residents would participate, which to me feels more right. Let, let's say that's what it is, and, and there's benefits to both sides of that equation. So for the 500 or 1,000, because I figure it's probably more like 1,000 just from what I saw last time, sure. and the people I just saw, they recognize, and they seem to be from San Dimas, and you talk to a lot of them. We're putting on, this is, for those who participate in the event, um, and right now I'm, we're talking about trying to minimize the effect on all the businesses, which I think staff has done a good job doing, but the people are participate. And you see the families out there, you see the, the older folks, you see everybody in between doing the long bike rides, whether they're, they're you know, in wheelchairs or they're walking, they got their dogs, they got their strollers, they got everything else. And everybody is just having a great time. There's performers, there's vendors, there's lots of things to do along the route, especially in our section of it. You know, when it gets over to Pomona, it's in, on Arrow Highway, which I think we can all agree is a great way of avoiding in, any impacts on anything, but it's not that fun of a place to, to be, whereas this part of San Dimas is a great place. And when you roll it into the Earth Day and the Arbor Day and showing what the city can do, our residents have fun, get a benefit, and, and, and see what the city's doing, um, and it's just a great fun event for them. For the other 90 to 99% that aren't in San Dimas, when I was at the other event, and I spent most of my time in San Dimas, I, I didn't uh, you know, traverse the route in the other cities, I talked to a number of people who said things like, boy, I've never been to San Dimas before, this is a great community. And they did notice the businesses, and you see them eating at the restaurants and seeking out those five, six, seven, eight restaurants that they can find in the in the downtown area so on this day in particular 
it there's effects both ways and I just think it's a great fun event to have and the long-term effects of um, what would you call it marketing market marketing exposure um, is a benefit to the to the city in the long run I mean it's okay, I suppose, in a way, and I, when my wife and I moved here, we loved the fact that San Dimas was isolated and insulated, and we thought it was kind of hidden behind the hills, and you know nobody was ever going to come here, so we wanted it to be that way and never change. But in, on the other hand, I think I and my wife and others have come to like the idea that people will come and patronize our businesses from outside the city. They will come to our events and have fun and just realize what a great town San Dimas is. This is, all, this is like a marketing dream come true. All the people that realize that San Dimas is here, and uh, whether it's just for this event, and they come out just for the bike ride, because they go to all of them all around the region, or if they come back again and again, um, I think it's just a benefit to the city. And paying $17,000 for this kind of an event is really a small, small price to pay. Scott, I'm going to put you up against the wall. Okay? We got to take this money from reserves, 17660 or whatever it is. If I just gave you an envelope and there was 17660 in it, what could your parks and recreation do? If this event what didn't exist, but I just we wrote you a, a, a check for that much money. What could you guys do to better what we have now? I mean, it's, it, it, we could do a capital improvement project. We could offer additional programming. I mean, there, there are a lot of things that we could probably do. Right, well, I still have, personally, I still have some issues with, with uh, the Alberson Shopping Center. Um, Ryan brought up an interesting thing when he said San Dimas. Have, uh, San Dimas Canyon, okay. What do I get if I cut this in a, a little bit and I say we do it from Walnut for, do I get gain anything? The shopping center becomes open completely. If we came out of if the other end of the park, okay, most of San Dimas can come now from the w west to the east to get to the park for Arbor Day and stuff. I'm, I'm just trying to mm -hmm. get there. I, I appreciate Eric's um, marketing strategy and all this stuff. I don't know if it's gonna be here in five years. I don't, I don't know. That the numbers are, I, I agree with him that the numbers should be more like 500. But I can sit here and tell you, uh, I know that three of us on this council right now participated Four years ago, or, you know, uh, I know John's kids did. I know my kids did, but they could get to those stores, you know, to the to the west. Okay, now we're we're blocking that off, so I don't I don't see the real benefit of of, of the downtown people, and I'm not sure that people are going to, you know, see the downtown portion if they're starting off at, you know, the shopping center. And I'll agree with the mayor that having participated in this, riding my bike with my wife through it, I mean, look, the truth is, this is an outstanding event for regional individuals, for state elected individuals, and for federal individuals looking to further either electric bikes, or bike lanes, or open streets, and mass transportation, that's great. But as it relates to a resident here in the city of San Dimas, I just, I'm not saying we can't participate. I'm saying, you know, the way to minimize that with the monies allotted to still increase awareness and participate would be to work within the means of the program and look at something like San Dimas Canyon Road. I think the problem with Walnut Mare is, you know, if I was participating again, you know where I'm going to park? I'm going to still park in the shopping center because I'm going to unload and walk over to Walnut. And uh, I think the other thing is, you know, I'd be curious what the data is from Ciclavia or who, however many residents actually participated the last time we did this. That's data that we should be able to get from registration in the event. But uh, we have that number, right? 
we have an estimate of how many. I don't. I don't have that number at my fingertips. I've, uh, well, I've seen it. Uh, Chris, what is what are the reserves right now? Just a pro real approximate number. To the, to the nearest million dollars. What are our reserves? A few more dollars than what the cost of this program what, is. What is it? Twenty. <laughs> Twenty some odd. But we're we're at somewhere in the order of about around twenty six million. Twenty six million. Just a second. Give me just one second, folks. All right. So we might want to spend seventeen um, thousand of that because I mean we could spend it if you just wanted to do it, and we would. That's um, while you're calculating seven seven one hundredths of a percent. Oh, we can't do that. Point zero 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 six seven of the. Uh, amount of money in our reserves. What, what we want to do is also introduce Caitlin Sims, who's here from the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, who also has been intimately involved with this event. Hello. Yes, just wanted to say hello. My name is, as he said, my name is Caitlin Sims. I'm the manager of local programs at the COG. I'm just here to help answer any questions that you have at the, at the event. But it's, I've been enjoying hearing the conversation, so thank you. I have a question. Yes, please. So, the, is what council member Ebner is saying true? The flexibility is governed by the route. Therefore, if we back into that money that the COG's not willing to compensate cities, so it is neutral? Well, and this is a grant from Metro, just to clarify that piece of it. And the reason, so it's a... Uh, we have a great relationship with I them, guess. by the way. Read the newspaper. <laughs> no taken. Yes, for, of course. Um, so when we submitted the route, the application, we submitted the route. It was the mileage that you can see on the screen here for all of the all of the cities, and we got our funding amount, which was the maximum of five hundred thousand um, dollars. So now, if we reduce the route at any point since that was what was approved, then the amount of funding that collectively the event gets gets is less. That's what that that's where that comes from. So if we were to reduce the the route in our city, and say Laverne decided to do an extra zigzag or whatever, could we move money to them? Yeah, I mean, if that's that's a conversation, I mean, we would have to talk to Laverne, obviously, to confirm that they would have the um, the ability to do that. There may be some additional costs for for Laverne then in that situation, but I mean, it's a it's a conversation that can be had around that piece of it. Cool. You know, J John brought up a question for me. We talked about registration, so we'd be be able to check those numbers with registration. I don't ever remember registering, and, and I mean, people just showed up with their with their trikes and their their yeah, bikes and baby strollers and and stuff like that, so I don't know that we would have any way of, of being able to determine yeah. who was a San Dimas resident or, or not. I remember. Um, no, it's, yeah, so it's oh, a shot in the dark. Though. Corey 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 Kalaka rode his bike from Claremont this way, and he still had to get back that way because he didn't have nobody picking him up. I saw Antonio Villaraigosa on a on a chariot or something riding around as well, so that was fun. So, so uh, Scott, the route that the mayor was talking about coming south on Walnut is so. That brings up an interesting point. Instead of wrapping around Civic Center Park, the details of what that route would really look like it is kind of hard to decipher from that uh, small map, but. It's, it, I imagine it kind of wraps around the Civic Center, comes down. Correct. Uh, there would be a hard closure here at uh, Iglesia, mm -hmm. and it would allow traffic into the shopping center, and then the route would come up. This is the length of the park, basically. So this is the parking lot past First Street up to the edge of the park, and actually I think that line can be continued around. So if instead of that route we got kind of go the opposite direction and dump everybody out from second street onto walnut south on walnut to bonita and then east on bonita to laverne it would be roughly the same distance and it would impact the shopping center a little less it would seem at least you know any any route change i think we would need to discuss with the cog and i think internally I'll let Sherry address that. <laughs> I so, think internally there would be some changes to our staffing also. So Walnut, um, we need to keep Walnut partially open to traffic because we have to um, keep traffic access or vehicle access to um, to the the apartment complex and the it's a I don't want a, a convalescent home on the north side okay. of uh, Bonita. Okay. So we can't close Walnut completely, but sure. for, to your point. Um, the way we would close Iglesia would allow access to um, 
to uh, the Albertsons market and all those businesses in that market. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that too. Um, you know, the only thing that I was thinking is if we pushed it to Walnut is that the additional driveway would be open at uh, the Albertsons. But I think the main ingress egress out of that parking lot is, uh, is Iglesia, so that should help a lot. Sandy Miss Avenue definitely would be insufficient. Sandy Miss Canyon Road, though, would, if you did go there, would ultimately not impact any of those north businesses, would resolve the issue at the shopping center, and would provide ample parking north and southbound on Sandy Miss Canyon Road. The church, normally Holy Name, has their own parking for mass that happens there, and they do sometimes have parking that goes south on Sandy Miss Canyon Road. But I think ultimately, in terms of the cost from the city, coupled with the events, I think it solves all of that, and it keeps your public safety access rolling, because even Walnut will impact the fire station, and it's gonna impact the sheriff's station on Pony Express. Well, it's going to impact the sheriff's station on Pony Express no matter what we do because it's going to be blocked off by people. Unless it went to Sandy Miss Canyon. Yeah. And, I, and to one point, I know John brought up the fact that 17,000 something's a fraction of a percentile from the reserves, but uh, don't, don't we have capital improvement projects at the Park and Recreation Center that $17,000 would go a long way? I think the locker room has some problems we've talked about. I think there's other things occurring there. So I'm just looking at what's a direct ROI to the residents of San Dimas. But what is our decision today? If, if we can't make a decision today and we ask more information, okay, do we have any, any, any leeway? You're looking here for a yes or a no answer. So let me, let me speak to that because we did uh, talk. The lady's shaking her head. We already got to, we, <laughs> go ahead. Chris. So we, we did talk with Marissa at the COG. The, uh, the COG needs to know this week to be, because they have to engage in the process with Metro to change the route. So for changing the route, they need to know yes or no, are we in or out, which would mean the route would start in Laverne and they would have to process that. Or if we're changing the route from what was originally submitted in the grant, they would have to submit that change to the process. And there's a numbers of hoops dealing with bureaucracy of an entity like Metro to get there. So timing wise, we need to get to an answer today. Um, the second piece, this event is like other, aside from it not being our event where we're sponsoring, it, we provide a lot of events and almost none of them actually become cost neutral. I think the one that came closest was the Halloween event we had at the Walker House, which was the first year we did it. We came within $1,000 of the actual cost of the event. But until we actually do full accounting of our events, which is something that I've asked our Parks and Recreation Department to do because we frequently keep costs outside of the equation, including this one, which doesn't have the cost of exempt staff because we're not paid for extra hours of service, yet we'll still be staffing the event. Uh, we don't know the true cost of each event. So I think we have to look at each of these events like, as a community like ours, we're providing a whole variety of services for the benefit of our community. What are those services we want to provide and what manner and what benefit do we derive that comes from it? If we look at it from a number of residents perspective, this may have far more than we have for some events that we offer elsewise, or it may not. If we look at it economically, we could look at the long term, what is the reputational value, but we also can look at what's the sales tax generation. You know, if we kept the original route at about $65,000, that is effectively an entire quarter sales tax for the entire downtown geo location from Albertsons to the far side of downtown. So we literally could take that entire money. It's a full quarter sales tax. So do you spend it on an event or do you retain that money used for somebody else? So we can make a lot of arguments depending on whether you want to sell it to do it or not do it. But the real question comes down to what are the kind of events and the intended impacts that you're willing to endure as a community. And so in some cases, this is going to dramatically impact some of the businesses downtown, and that may not be tenable for the council. Where is it that we realistically expect uh, people to park? Like, I, I, I get that Ryan's point that the closest and uh, most accessible parking lot is going to be a parking lot we don't want them to park in. And yeah, I, looking at the realistic side of trying to keep people out of there. I don't know that a few no event parking signs are really going to cut it, but I mean that 
is not necessarily the end of the world if we're able to uh, to direct parking to where we want it to be. But I don't know if we're just relying completely on street parking or. I don't know the total number that will come here from the total event, but clearly if you're on a bike, your radius of how far you're going to go to potentially hit the event is pretty large. You don't have to park at the Albertsons Parking Center if that's the start of the event. You're going to go to the park and ride downtown, in the neighborhoods, further down on Cataract. I mean, if we end up having 10,000 people land in our downtown, there's no way the Albertsons parking lot is going to be, it's going to be inundated, but so is so many other blocks outside. So I, I just haven't experienced the event to know how many of those people will land here to know how far out they go. I, I, I think 10,000 is a big, a big, big number. Um, but I do also uh, recognize the fact the other events that we have, um, the Albertsons parking lot takes a hit. It, the booster uh, car show, uh, it doesn't matter what we have in the downtown area, the Albertsons parking lot takes a hit. Okay, well, we matter. have the park and ride, which, you know, I, I assume there would be signage directing participants to park in the park and ride. And that's got how many ever spaces. Um, and then people will park on the streets. You know, you can make the argument that we shouldn't inconvenience anybody. Um, and I'm thinking about when we lived on the corner of Fourth and Walnut, uh, whether it was school or especially Little League, we had cars parked in front of our house during the duration of all those things. And, and for Little League, as you can imagine, in opening days coming up in a couple of Saturdays, people are gonna be parking in front of other people's houses. Now, and I've heard from many people who, who don't like that, obviously, and they, they, don't, they want the you know, unfettered access and, and not uh, people from outside the neighborhood parking. On the other hand, living in that area, and I think I'm the only member on the council who lives in that area now, I welcome the activity, and a lot of other people do it in the downtown, because we realize that that's what the downtown is like. So if we've got Little League, it's actually joyful to have the kids piling out of the cars and then back in after their, after their games. It's joyful to hear the sounds of the people playing in the park. Um, it's great to see people you know, coming down the street on San Dimas Avenue, which during this event there will be many, many people, especially families, walking and, and biking from the neighborhood that I live in down to the event. And it's just exciting to see people walking their dogs. I mean, today I was just you know, driving into my driveway and somebody from across the street was walking along, hailed me and went over, had a conversation and just was, it's just neat to have activity like this in the neighborhood. So I'm speaking just for myself and some others who I know feel the same way in the downtown area. Um, and I realize there's an impact. It's a, whatever it is, a six hour impact for them on a Sunday. Um, and on a lot of Sundays, it's nice to be really quiet in the neighborhood. But uh, I would just say that we should go with staff's modified recommendation, which they've discussed with the COG and I think has buy off from them and uh, for all the reasons of having the Earth Day and the Arbor Day and just the fun, fun, fun stuff to do, I think we should just do that and uh, bite the bullet on this. Sixteen thousand dollars is not nothing. I totally agree with you. You can use it for a number of things, and and we just disagree. I, I think this. It's a few trees, John. This is a great. Uh, this is a great event to have the. Uh, <laughs> if I. To have the. Uh, like two to, to, to use that money for. It's still so more if, than if, if I may, I just want to add one spin to Councilman Ebner's comments. Um, I don't live in downtown Samus, but I did live in really busy areas in two previous cities. So I lived in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., which is where a lot of events happen. They close streets there all the time. And in San Francisco, I lived near Haight-Ashbury, also a place where there's a lot of street closures. When I moved into those apartments in both areas, I understood what I was signing up for. That's why I chose not to, say, live in San Mateo and San, you know, in the Bay Area. That's why I chose not to live in Arlington or some other place in DC. Um, the benefit is that while there are street closures, while there is a lot of traffic, I could walk out my apartment and there I am. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to sign up and walk around. 
And so I would extend that um, same logic to the businesses that are also in downtown. There's a reason when you pick a, there's a reason why you pick a business in downtown. You know that it's going to get the most traffic in the city. But part of that also is a generation from events that may inconvenience you, but long term you're going to get more exposure. So I have to believe that uh, Albertsons, a very sophisticated um, retail shopping center, took that into account as they chose that location to operate their store. Uh, in fact, actually, I think that the number of street closures that we have, I have nothing to back this up, so it's just my own opinion, but I have to believe that it's probably a lot lower than similar stores that are located in other downtowns, and they probably account for that in their, their costs. So the numbers that I did present, I, I, I think Ryan makes a good point in terms of you don't really know until there's real numbers, but that's why you do forecasts. You do the best you can with the types of assumptions that you make, and you try to start at conservative, so that way anything above that is the upside. Um, when we did change the numbers to, let's just say, 99% uh, would not be Sandy Miss residents, the economic benefit actually goes up to, uh, in year one, so 2023, assuming that, again, 15% of those people either spend money that day or come back to San Dimas, that equates to about $750,000 in economic benefit in the city, which is pretty substantial. So I intend to vote in favor of this as is. Um, I think that if you start playing around with the types of configurations, it's going to make it more complicated, but also you lose out on that exposure. Uh, and I also have to believe that while it is inconvenience for stores in that area, I believe that everybody there has an understanding that this is what happens in downtowns and is gracious enough to um, be a part of this. And so for that, uh, I hope my other council members will join me, but as always, I respect the decision-making process for each of the five up here. Everyone brings a different perspective, different ideas and inputs. However you may vote, I know it's going to be based upon um, uh, information that should not be discounted, and I think that that's okay. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I do have one more question. The so when I have trepidations about this, it's not because of seventeen thousand dollars. I could spend seventeen thousand dollars on a public event, especially if it's something that our community, uh, you know, will hopefully go out to and, and participate in. Um, th that's not the 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 holdup for me. That the holdup for me really chiefly is the parking concern. Um, I, I think even if it were at San Dimas Canyon and Benita, we're talking at quite a number of people, quite a number of cars, and, and it's on a Sunday, and Holy Name of Mary would probably be impacted as well. So we'd just be in, uh, you know, if we were to move it there, it would likely be just kicking the can down and creating a problem there. The question that I would have is, I haven't actually been out to the dirt lot that's east of the Forest Service building to see how flat that is, but it's a dirt lot that seems like it could potentially be an area where we could park a lot of cars right along the, the route. And I don't know if that's a suitable location to set up, a, like an official event parking. It's a great idea. We could. The, yes. it, okay. Um, it, that, would, that would be my suggestion. I, I think that would hopefully offset um, some of the parking concerns. Obviously nothing, um, uh, we, we need to, to do what we can um, personnel wise. I don't know what the right answer is. I, I trust staff to, to figure out what, what it is that we could do for something like Albertsons. Obviously no event parking signs uh, at the entrances that, that will be open to, uh, to Benita and St. Amos Ave um, are a start, but I, I think you know, going even further than that and doing what we can to make sure that those businesses have parking spaces so that those uh, those businesses can still uh, operate. Uh, so, are, so are you saying go with this program here and hopefully people will park in the dirt lot? Yeah, advertise the, uh, put very clear signage out that uh, the dirt lot is for event parking and then put very clear signage out that the um, Albertsons lot is, you know, not for it. Uh, event parking and obviously we also have the, the park and ride down there too which is 
which uh, at a, on a Sunday would be uh, completely available. And so if we wanted to put signage up, directing people to the park and ride and to the dirt lot, that's, that's fine too. But, you know, looking at the sheer numbers of people that uh, have showed up to this event in the past, I just don't know that the park and ride in and of itself would be sufficient for parking. Well, I'm going to, uh, I appreciate your point and I'm not opposed to that dirt lot. It's not often I get to tactfully agree to disagree with two who have already said their points and and I will offer this having having lived in the downtown the last time this event occurred uh, and still having having people that live there that I know there are a lot of people that are just exhausted from traffic here and I just and even as recent as today with Arrow Highway and the public works projects and things that are going on, the negative impact of the Gold Line construction, another metro project here or Gold Line construction project. And now again, we're looking at something imposing another metro program onto our downtown. You know, I lived in downtown L.A. for a year and I'll tell you this. Uh, I hear your point about living down there. I understand, and I even live next to the uh, 7th and Flower Station, so I appreciate being able to walk. But I also appreciated not being impacted by the events like Ciclavia and others and protests and other things that kept you literally from being able to get in your car and go somewhere, especially if you wanted to. And something always happens. Sunday's a meal prep day. It's a grocery day. It's it's a day for people. And, uh, and I have a hard time, uh, you know, I, I appreciate John's perspective of the energy and the livelihood of the folks that will be visiting. But for 500 residents, um, I don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze when we can actually still support the event in a way that doesn't negatively impact the place. It's already been literally traumatized from exhaustive impacts from construction. And they still are. It's not done. And the park and ride, I don't think, is sufficient enough or close enough to be able to provide parking um, there. And so uh, I don't know when the motion comes out, um, but short of it being at San Dimas Canyon Road in Bonita, I'm just not going to support it because, I, you know, we're supposed to represent the residents. And even though I may not live in the downtown still, I talk to people that live down there, and I just got to tell you, you know, they have been back to back to back to back closures and rerouting signs, you know, the whole nine yards, Monta Vista is gone now. So, you know, I just, this to me is too much. There's already a community event going on there for residents. And uh, I just feel that residents should be able to travel on a Sunday without any more detours and, and what have you to an event that we traditionally would have. And if you put it on Saturday because we don't do this, it's not gonna hurt my feelings either. But uh, the bottom line is, I just, I, I thinking through the parking as Eric's pointing out, I'm not opposed to using that parking if you even moved it to San Dimas Canyon Road because the truth of the matter is, you're right, Eric, people are gonna park north and south on San Dimas Canyon. They're gonna spill east or i'm sorry westbound from san dimas canyon hopefully they'll patronize butter and the farmer's market store there and everything else that's there but it'll it'll minimally impact or at least as much as possible mitigate the negative impact on our grocery store that is a sales tax revenue generator and all those restaurants and hopefully people patronize them i don't believe that people and i i appreciate the kicking the can down the road and i think you're right people will but if these people are active people they very well may still end up walking down there to check out what's going on. And I hope that they do. And I hope that we participate in this. Um, but I just, I can't support something that's going to intrude so far into our downtown and negatively impact Commercial Street, Railway, uh, these folks that live north uh, of Benita. It's just all of them are going to experience people parking in front of their homes, potentially blocking their driveways, blocking their grocery store. Uh, you know, and not, not even potentially be from the area. Any further? I'll just add one thing. It's an observation, again, not scientific, but at the Christmas parade, uh, the holiday event, uh, I, I'm going to give away a little bit of a secret, so I hope it doesn't become, but I, I try to go to Starbucks. Starbucks was packed. 
So I went to Albertsons because they have a Starbucks there. The line was shorter. Probably won't be now that I'm announcing this. So <laughs> the secret. <laughs> that Starbucks. is a secret. That is a secret. A shorter line. But I was struck by how many people were going into Albertsons, and they were buying things like chips and water and that sort of a thing that Albertsons probably wouldn't have had the sales of. And I, I, I believe that because they had on like Christmas you know, hats and stuff like that. So there is some benefit that, that Albertsons, it, it's not a total loss. They're getting a lot of customers buying things that, that they wouldn't have you know, if it was just an ordinary day. So I just want to call that out as an observation so that I do believe on balance it's, it's not as negative as maybe we think. Uh, and wanted to put that out there. Okay. Willing like to entertain a motion, Mr. Mayor? I will entertain a motion. All right. I would move that we um, follow staff's recommendation of the modified route for the Heart of the Foothills Open Streets event, and that we um, are, are open, or we want to uh, allocate seventeen thousand six hundred sixty dollars. If that can be done in this, at this time, or if we need a separate thing for the money, we can, we can do that in the same motion uh, for, the, for the event. And sign the MOU with COG. I'll second that. So sign the MOU with COG, $17,660, and the route that staff is proposing. Okay. Any further conversation? Uh, the I know probably not relevant to the uh, the motion itself as far as the the piece that the cog needs, but I'm assuming that that would be uh, directing staff to also explore the the parking lot. And Wait, number four, directing staff to explore the dirt parking lot that. And I'll second that. Eric Weber. Let me let me just about. clarify because I think Sherry and I had a little disagreement on which parking lot. We're not talking about any cataract. You're talking about the Forest Service lot. Correct. Yeah, there's a large uh, dirt lot that's over there. I've never been there myself. It looks like there's vehicle tracks where vehicles drive on it. So, so you're ta the the Forest Service lot. Yeah. Okay. Then I need to retract my statement. It, it'll it'll take a significant amount of. I mean, we can go talk to them, the federal government, but we have two months. <laughs> they talk about two years. So, <laughs> but I would say potentially. Um, Benita, the lot on Benita Cataract, which would also have people walking through our downtown, it would be an option. Yeah, I mean, that would be another option as well. Um, I, I, my, my main concern, like I said, was the, the, uh, the doing whatever we can to direct people to an actual parking place so that they're not just, it's not a free-for-all. But the motion will include asking staff to explore the Forest Service property in an expedited manner, if you can. And, and, and Bonita Cataract would be an option? It, it is. Yeah. We control the property, yes. Yeah. Okay. So is the motion clear then? No, no Chris? I just need some clarity. Go ahead. So I'm hearing a motion by Councilmember Evander, second by Nakano, to approve $17,000 and the appropriation on the modified route and to allocate the funding for the event, sign the MOU which presumes also my ability to execute the agreements and a suggestion about focusing efforts on parking that take away from the impacts in the downtown core of Albertsons, the Albertsons area, correct? That's fine. Okay. I think, the, I think that last part will, will just work internally with staff in terms of directing that piece of it. Okay. Before we vote, and not that I'm going to support it, but just to be clear, it's not 17000 There's $660 more uh, that need to be allocated. Yeah, it <laughs> well, that's, that's the deal breaker. Never mind. Uh, well, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> no, that's, it should be clear. Yeah. It should be very clear. My question is, if we approve this and go over to the $17,660, okay, what is the likelihood that the COG is going to come back tomorrow and tell us, no, the number is the numbers actually a little bit higher, okay? And so what's that, that likelihood? That the COG's only going to grant us the $25,000. they are not controlling the expense side. That's on the city. Okay. So what's the likelihood that the city, our staff, is going to come back and say, 
that it's going to cost us more money. And I'm not talking six, you know, sixty-one dollars or something like that. I'm talking about, you know, three, four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars or something like that. We'd probably just remove staff and ask five council members to volunteer their time. Yeah. No. Done. <laughs> No, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's you're a, exempt, it's a, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. We, we have we we, we, we have one. <laughs> so I, I think I think the issue we can play we've played with the expense numbers, which is why we got down to seventeen thousand. Um, a heavy a heavy dose of that ends up being the public safety costs. We have exempt employees that are not paid; they're not considered in these dollar amounts. And so, if the target is seventeen thousand six hundred and sixty we would work internally on the staffing to get to the numbers that were approved by the council, but also recognized I have authority to transfer money up to a certain dollar amount across accounts. So just kind of blew it right now. Yeah. I'm just, but again, we're talking, we're talking about a dollar amount that's within the threshold of the city manager to transfer between available accounts. And so I think we got to stick to, I think what's the most important aspect of this is this is an event that the city either wants to contribute to and be a part of or not an event that has some type of impacts that the council's desire is that we mitigate and that's those are the kind of trade-offs that we're really talking about in terms of this and so what i'm hearing with the motion on the table is it is an event we want to perform we understand that the costs are approximately seventeen thousand six hundred and sixty plus the eighteen thousand and some change in kind contribution and that we want to mitigate the impacts around the Albertsons Shopping Center to be able to perform said event is really the action that we're taking as a council. Just a clarifying question. This ultimately could be denied by Metro, this proposal that you guys are about to pass. And then what happens? If Metro doesn't approve the change in which the original item would be there, we would, be, we would, be, we would not be doing the event. And I will say as well that we have no indication that that would actually happen. They're on their understand. They understand what's going on right now. So well, anything can happen. We have no ac expectation that that would actually happen. Perfect. Well, I'll just say I'm, I obviously will not support the motion just because I believe the city should be exploring a route that is very possible to be a lesser expense uh, and a minimal impact to residents in the city. Uh, that is very possible for the city still to participate in, and therefore I won't support it. But I uh, appreciate the, the motion. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually support the, the, the Parks and Rec recommendation. But when I read the, my agenda, my agenda says you're not planning on re recommending it. And yet you made the changes and I appreciate what you, you guys have done. I do have some real concerns about Albertsons, um, but I just kind of go back in my brain, which isn't good, is that I remember that day, the Cyclavia, okay, and I was astounded about how many people there were. Uh, I, I, I have hard to believe that just 500 residents from San Dimas were there. I would have I thought more I appreciate uh, Eric's um, whatever he does in the marketing world, but the reality is that uh, I just saw a lot of people having fun. Okay, I'm actually a little bit disheartened. I don't want to pay. I don't want to pay sixty-seven thousand dollars. I have no intent to doing that. But I'm really disappointed that we couldn't work it out where our downtown business people could have been involved in it because. You can sit here and say people are going to walk down there, but they might take their bikes. But I don't see, uh, and I may be wrong, Sweet Savory, uh, I don't see them opening up on a, on a hunch. Okay? Um, I, I would imagine Pizzetto's, I don't know they're going to open up on a hunch. Uh, so that, that, that little, little concerns me. Because we, if we talk about people coming back and looking and seeing, I just remember when we voted um, in favor of doing the high school uh, parade, homecoming parade, it created massive amount of problems in the downtown areas from the businesses. But we kept, we kept doing it and we kept, kept it on. And, and, and now these people are asking, hey, when's that, when's that parade? 
okay? Because places like Emerson's Gift Shop and uh, Roadies and people, you know, who never come to downtown San Dimas. So I, I, I want to believe that more people will, will come to it. And I think that's a marketing thing that, that uh, the COG has to do because it's, downtown's going to know it. But people in Via Verde and the people up by the golf course and on Terrebonne, they're not going to know it unless we figure out how to get that information out to them. Okay. I'm going to support it this time, but that's not to say that I uh, don't have some, some real concerns. And, uh, you know, and I, I hope tomorrow morning, when, when the phones get turned on, that I don't get a call from the, all the businesses at the Albertson Shopping Center because, you know, they've said more than, you know, they, you know, they, they were concerned about their businesses. So, I'll call for a vote. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All opposed? No. Vote, uh, measure passes uh, four to one. With Councilmember Vienna voting no. Okay, okay with Councilman Vienna. Uh, and I'm just now being told by the management that we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Okay.
Consideration and approval of tentative track map 19-0001-82422, Development Plan Review Board 19-0026, and Tree Removal per Permit 21-0053, Excella Project 190056. A request to subdivide one parcel into six residential parcels to construct six detached single family residence and remove nine protected trees within the single family, family agriculture 7500 zone. Located at 649 West Gladstone, APN 8392-020-001. And to categorically exempt the project from California Environmental Quality Act under Section 15332, infill projects, Class 32. Ken Fesselman. Right, mayor and council members, so as the mayor said, we are here to talk about a tentative tract map, a development plan review board for the architectural style of single family homes and the tract map layout and a tree removal permit tonight. All this is taking place at 645 West Gladstone Street. So the applicant has submitted an application on behalf of the property owner for the development of a six partial subdivision and that will be associated with construction of six detached single family residences and the removal of nine protected trees. This is the lot where the subdivision will take place. It's on the north east corner of Gladstone and Amelia with Ghent bordering on the north. There is currently a single family home on the northwest corner of the lot and a vacant little store on the southwest corner of the lot. This is the view from the southwest corner where you can see the, the little store. Um, the trees over here we will talk about in the future and this is the oak grove that runs along Gladstone. Uh, view from the northwest corner. Uh, the single family home being shown will be demolished as part of the project. Uh, from the northeast corner on Ghent looking back down towards Gladstone. And a view from the southeast corner on Gladstone looking up towards Ghent and Amelia. <coughs> the project is located within the single family <coughs> agriculture 7500 zone. Uh, no zone change or general plan amendment is required, which is why we are exempting it from CEQA. It is currently developed with a vacant corner store and a single family residence, which will both be demolished. On October 27th of last year, the DPRB recommended approval of the DPRB case and the tree removal permit. The DPRB did make the following changes to the conditions of approval. Uh, they wanted us to revise a condition to require street trees along the new proposed street. They added a condition to work with staff to preserve trees two and three. And we'll talk about what the numbers mean in a second. And they added a condition to work with staff to reconsider adding sidewalks along Gladstone to aid in tree preservation. So this is the site. There are currently eight live oak trees that are along Gladstone. Uh, six of them in red are on city property and city trees and the two in green are on private property. The private trees are trees two and three. On December 1st of last year, the Planning Commission recommended approval of tentative track map 19-001, the DPRB case, and the tree removal permit. The Planning Commission also directed staff to work with the applicant and public works to reconsider the length of the proposed right turn lane. In the initial submittal um, that you have in the plans, there was a full right turn lane going all the way from Amelia to the edge of the property. Um, so there would be a right-hand turn lane that would start here, would cut all the way across, and it would actually be even with an existing curb that is already on Gladstone. Um, the issue with that is that it would necessitate the, the removal of six trees for sure and probably all eight. So the Planning Commission wanted us to work with Public Works to see if there was any way to change the length of the proposed right turn lane in order to save some of the trees. 
Uh, this is the site plan for the project. So there will, there will be a new cul-de-sac that will be built off Ghent. Lots one through five will take access from that cul-de-sac. Lot six will take access from Ghent. Street trees will surround the, the project and the cul-de-sac. And there will be a new sidewalk installed along Amelia and along Ghent. Uh, the tentative track map, uh, we're keeping the SFA 7500 zoning of the current parcel, so all the lots will be between over 7500 and will be between 7845 and 8841. Resin sizes are all about 2900 square feet, and they all have a lot coverage of between 22% and 25%. Uh, all the lots meet the standards of the parcel. Lot size is over 7500. Minimum width at the street is 75 feet. Uh, there are cul-de-sac lots, and in that case, our code does say that the width can be reduced to 35 feet at the street as long as they do widen out to hit at least 70 feet on the lot, and all these lots do conform with that. Uh, the applicant will be responsible for constructing a new cul-de-sac, which will then be dedicated to the city. Uh, the applicant will also dedicate two feet along North Amelia and four feet along East Gladstone. Uh, the dedication will allow for sidewalk and landscaping along the streets. Uh, all the improvements will be built by the developer and dedicated and maintained by the city. And as part of this, the, developer, or the applicant will also construct the right-hand turn lane on westbound East Gladstone onto North Amelia. So there's two architectural themes being proposed. There's craftsman style and a Spanish style. Both styles have an oversized two-car garage, large front porches. Uh, this is the front shot of the Spanish style. It's a floor plan with 2,459 square feet of living area, four bedrooms, four and a half baths. Um, it's got the white stucco on the outside, the arched windows, the heavy wood on the door, and the window shutters, architectural wrought ironwork. These are all consistent with what would be a Spanish style home. For clarification, would this be uh, either or, or it would the development include a mix of both? It's a mix of both, and they're already called out in the plans. So there will be two Spanish style, and then when we get to the craftsmen, there'll be four craftsmen, but there's two different styles. There'll be two of each. Great, thank you. This is the craftsman style. And as I said, there are two of each design uh, just to change up the exterior so that the cul-de-sac doesn't look too similar. Uh, top one has the lower horizontal paneling. It has upper shingling. It'll have a um, shingled roof that will mimic wood. It's got these stone columns and the large porch and the uh, wood surrounds on the window. The other style is basically the same, except it does have the horizontal siding the entire way up. Um, and it has the belt course to break up the first and second story. So the proposed development will require the removal of nine trees. Um, two California live oaks along Gladstone, which are both city trees. And then the other seven are all on private property and mainly around the single family house, two Chamel ash, and then a mulberry, carrot wood, California pepper, white sapote, and cherimoya. Uh, for the city trees, the removal is recommended by Public Works to allow for the construction of a right-hand turn lane and sidewalk. Uh, the plans you have in front of you do show a continuous right turn lane. We have since worked with Public Works after the Planning Commission hearing. Um, And this is an alternative layout that has been presented to us by Public Works. <coughs> so rather than continue all the way back, the right-hand turn lane will stop right about at the edge of where the little store now is. It will bulb out and then return to the curb line. Uh, this will still necessitate the removal of two of the trees, the, the one here and the one here. And then the other six we will work with to preserve them in place. Um, so through working with Public Works, we think this is this meets what Public Works thinks we need as far as the length of the right turn lane. It creates a safer driving condition down Gladstone and does save, or it aids in the preservation of six of the trees. So the other nine or the other seven trees are all surrounding the single family home. Um, no protected species. It's just trees that were planted um, for the enjoyment of the residents, but they do hinder the development of the new homes. Um, as part of this, the applicant is proposing 68 trees be planted as part of a landscape plan. How many? 68. 
Okay. 25 of those trees will be street trees. Those will be maintained by, by the city. And 43 trees will be planted on private property as part of the development. Um, as we stated earlier, the project is categorically exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15332, it's infill development, um, since there is no zone change or no general plan change. Um, with that, staff, the Development Plan Review Board, and the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council adopt resolution 2023-08, approving DPRB case number 190026 and tree removal permit 21-0053. Staff and the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council adopt Resolution 2023-08 approving tentative track map 19-001 and to categorically exempt this product from CEQA under Section 15332. With that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm here for any questions and we do have the applicant if you have any questions for them. Questions? One point of clarification. So you said how many trees would be removed in total? Nine trees in total. Nine trees in total. Two city trees, nine, or two city trees, seven private trees. And with 68 new trees, then it would be a net gain for the city of 59 trees? Yes. Great. I have two basic questions. One is that, uh, so the public works improvements on the street and, and all that, relocating the poles and those kind of things, is it, is it the case that the applicant or the developer will be bearing that cost? Yes. Okay, and so Public Works has th thought that this would be a good idea to have that right turn lane extended, and so therefore, uh, and it, the poles have to be moved because they're in the way and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's a Public Works uh, preference on that, but the yes. applicant will, will bear it. The, the applicant is performing all of the work. It will be either dedicated to this city or it's already in the public right of way. My question on that is, um, I, I guess since we're pro proposing it, there, the staff feels there's a nexus between this development, which exit o exits over on Ghent, there's a nexus between the development and uh, improving a traffic pattern or flow on Gladstone, which is to the rear of the development. What, what is that nexus? I would have to defer to Public Works. Okay. I'll go ahead and respond to that. The, uh, Gladstone Street is is listed as a collector street in our uh, uh, general plan. Um, therefore, it's it's slated for two lanes each direction, full width sidewalk, uh, curb and gutter, et cetera. Um, so that's the nexus for this because this development is developing the corner. So that portion of the project, uh, in order to make it in compliance, and that was why we started with the initial full width improvement with the full right turn lane, et cetera. Uh, consequently, we, we did some additional analysis. We think we can reduce that right turn lane and some of those formal improvements or ultimate improvements at this time uh, and still have it as a safe, uh, safer uh, uh, path of travel right now than, than present day. Okay. It, and Dave and uh, Ken, my, my question is, uh, I mean, to the mind of, of some people, those improvements aren't necessitated, necessitated by the development. So why would we make the developer pay for it? And, and maybe the answer is that it's allowed, so, so we're, we're doing that. Is that, that what it is? Essentially, yeah. It's, uh, they're touching a portion of that right away with their improvement, with their project, creating six lots, and, and that gives us the right uh, at least in front of this development to to have the developer or the applicant pay for that those costs okay appreciate that uh, my my other question is about the trees um, we wouldn't get away from the discussion without some tree you're, you're waiting for it Ryan so we're going to talk about trees for just a second um, and I noticed the um, can you had that the alternate um, design up there could you just show it so I could ask the question and I noticed that the right turn uh, well, the, the whole street is widened a little bit, it looks like. Um, therefore, it gets kind of close to that tree that's kind of opposite where Amelia comes out there. Um, the current width is not really getting that close to that tree. So uh, if we didn't widen it there a little bit, 
then maybe that tree could be preserved, because I know that's one of the ones you were talking about removing. This one will have to come out almost certainly. It has some structural defects in it that in place right now, there are no targets. So there's no house behind it it could hit. It's a little farther from the street. Um, but the structural defects do make it more likely to fail. To fail so and then do what? It would either cause damage to the residents behind it or crash across the street, especially because we would be leveling the berm that is there right now. So this one, it was recommended by our arborist that because of the defects in it, it has a, a cavity in the trunk that is healed, but the tree will never be as safe as it should be at that point. So it was recommended that that one would be removed just because as soon as we had targets like the house or putting it closer to traffic where there's no longer as much safety room beside it, it, it could cause a danger. All right, thank you for that answer. And then the other one um, that's farther west, and I think it's numbered eight on some of the, the plans, um, is there a way of creatively getting around that tree, maybe either pulling the, the lane out a little bit so it's not, so it looks like it's, it's a little bit away from the trunk. Um, and you know, if it had four feet, it would probably be easily preserved since many, many oak trees have that much on San Dimas Avenue and elsewhere or less. Or creatively doing a retaining wall of some kind similar to what we've done in at least two places that I can think about. Right up Amelia there, there's a, an oak tree that was preserved and it was the same kind of creative thinking that staff um, was able to come up with and preserve that oak tree. And Dave may remember it uh, because we had that nice little windy street there and yet the oak tree is preserved with a, with a wrought iron fence and a, a, a guardrail and stuff like that. And then more recently, when we did Golden Hills Road, there was a tree up at the top. And I'm not sure if that was actually in Laverne or San Dimas. It was right on the, the border, basically. It was slated for removal. And through a lot of discussion and uh, direction, actually, um, Public Works was able to come up with a good way of preserving that tree. And I think they trimmed it and put a wall there and that kind of thing. So I was just wondering if uh, it's possible to change that alternate just slightly so that that oak tree, which is probably the best out of the eight there, um, could be preserved. Uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. Um, we had some traffic counts uh, obtained for the intersection uh, after the holidays. And based on the volumes, for the right turn volume specifically, uh, the turn pocket needs to be 100 feet minimum uh, for, that, for those peak hour uh, vehicles, both that's morning, afternoon, and lunchtime. So that's why we set up that 100 foot. If you see a little bit further east between trees seven and eight, we have it's labeled 90 foot transition. Yes, that's kind of like the, the 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 portion of the the berm that would transition to that new curb line. That possibly could be shrunk to 60 feet, and I think uh, in all likelihood that that is a great possibility. Uh, However, you know, uh, MUTCD has specific guidelines for uh, curb transitions when you're creating lanes and whatnot. Um, the old days, you, you got away with it. You know, this was 75 years old. Um, regulations have changed. So uh, we, we have certain guidelines that we have to adhere to. If, if we can shrink that to 60 feet, certainly it's something we can look at, uh, but it's something that also we'd have to come up with a, a, an alternative design and consult with the arborist. Because uh, you have to remember that that tree has a large canopy on it. You, if, if there is a driving lane there, you have to trim the, the branches high enough that it don't get hit. Um, and what that does to the integrity of the tree, only the arborist, the, the experts know that. Um, so it's something that obviously we don't want it We'd love to have all the tree, all the oak trees stay, uh, but for for safety purposes, this is our recommendation. Uh, Ken mentioned the tree seven, that uh, because it is in the right of way, uh, the city would be liable um, if that were to fall one way or the other. Uh, so that's a reason for that. And, and again, that's that'll be the arborist ultimate the decision on that. And with consultation with the arborist for tree eight, uh, we'll try and save it, but. Um, in all likelihood, I think it might be difficult. Um. All right. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. If council wanted, they could add a condition to, again, work with staff because this will have to come back to council for the approval of the final map. Got it. 
Thanks and so much. I, and I'm sorry, the, this is the alternate layout. Can I, let me see the other one really quick. And So this is a straight curb that would go all the way back along the property. And you don't have a detail really that gets this down as the other one does for the alternate on that? No, the alternate was done specifically as a, it's, it's more preliminary, but it was done just for council to show that after doing traffic counts and kind of working with what council said, or the planning commission said that we did come up with an alternate. So is the, but this is what staff, what's staff recommending? The alternate or are you recommending like this is what it, no. This, this is the recommendation. No, the, the recommendation is the alternate at this point. The alternate is the recommendation. Okay. All right. And that that's with the planning commission and DPRB. DPRB didn't have the purview to tell us to. They weren't looking at the right-hand turn lane. It isn't within their purview. They recommended we try to work with Public Works to save trees as far as the sidewalk went. Planning commission, because the right-hand turn lane was in their purview. Um, did not like the layout where it goes all the way back and did ask us to work on creating a new layout for the turn lane. Okay. Right. Can you go to the alternate one more time? Let me see that. Yeah, so this line would go straight back and meet up with here on, on the, uh, the first proposal. So this is your recommendation? This is our recommendation. Okay. Is there still a sidewalk there in the alternate version? There's a path here. It, it potentially a, could be a meandering DG path all right. in, in between the trees with minimal excavation and whatnot uh, um, that hopefully we could fit that in there. It's, it's, as you get clo further east, it gets a little tight. Yeah. Um, we're not 100% sure we can fit it in there. Because it has to be minimum four feet wide for uh, ADA concerns. So. And that is also something that the Planning Commission wanted us to work with because if this map continued up, the actual sidewalk ends right here. There is no sidewalk across Gladstone from that point on. Right, from, from that point, well, on both sides of Gladstone, you're taking your life in your hands if you're walking or riding, or, which you see people doing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, there's nowhere to go, in fact. Encouraging people to go on a sidewalk and then realizing they can't go anywhere and then they want to go over to Amelia is kind of dangerous in itself, uh, it seems, to, that people would yeah. want to cross over to where there is a sidewalk. And I would agree with you because this, this uh, north side of the street is the one without any buffer, really. So the safer place to walk once you got over here would be on the south side of the street because there is that eight-foot section across, between the lane and private property. So we could have potentially have people trying to run across the street just to get to that easier place to walk. Can tell me about the property to the east of uh, this property? Right here? Yes. It's just a single family home. Um, there's, I mean, going down Gladstone from here on is all single family homes. And she is actually looking to sell and in fact, just let us know a few weeks ago that she would not mind being a part of this project, but this is too far along at this point to include it. Okay. All right, any, any additional questions? The, the purpose, Oh, okay, let's keep going and then we'll get back to that. Okay. Uh, I had one. So, um, sure. Just to clarify, the financing for this project is secured. There's no risk that this would fall through uh, because of the changing economic climate or we can, changes in credit. We can never make that guarantee. We are approving the tentative track map. I see. Um, we don't get involved in financing. So while we hope that this is something that was moved forward years ago and then halted because of financing and is now moving forward again. So we would hope that they will continue. Uh, but staff doesn't get involved in the financing aspect, so we have no way to guarantee that. Is this the same developer? No. No. Oh. Just, I do have one question. So sometimes we'll, just that raises the, the point of the question, sometimes we'll have somebody come in, get a tentative tract approved, level everything, take everything out of the, off the property, and then it's a vacant lot for, and then, then they don't develop. Um, and they want to sell it to somebody else or whatever, but um, is there anything where we can condition the removal of things on the property with some kind of actual start of the, con the, the development itself? Yeah, for a project like this, what we would normally do is building issues, the demo permit and the construction permits. They will not issue the demo permit until we have construction permits basically ready to issue. All right. um, there have been 
times when that hasn't happened. It isn't happening right now in Allen and Cataract, but that's because those have been deemed kind of a public nuisance. Um, we have no reason to believe that there's any kind of nuisance here. The, pro the property has been as is for the last six to 10 years. The only problem is the dumping that occurs on it at times. And so we have no reason at this point to allow the demo to occur before we have permits ready to issue. All right, thanks. All right. Any other, any other questions, Council? All right, this time we'll open up the public hearing. Anyone uh, w listening to speak in favor of this project? Seeing no one, anyone opposing this project? I just have a question. I don't, I'm not opposing it or otherwise. Um, wasn't there rules before about utilities that when you do these kinds of projects that utilities have to be run underground? Did that change or did I miss something? Ken, could you address that please? Because there's a lot of wires in that, on that corner. Yeah, the helicopter guy would know that. Um, and that is true. Normally we would make people underground utilities, but in this case, those are actual transmission wires. Edison will not allow us to underground those through there. So if they were just serving the local houses, yes, we would underground them, but these are actually transmitting power across the city. Um, and they would, since they would only be undergrounded for about the 200 yards, Edison just isn't going to go for that in this instance. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to uh, speak to the council, either pro or against? We'll close the public hearing. Council? We'll entertain a motion to approve or deny. I'll move approval as recommended by staff to adopt resolution 2023-08 approving the tentative track map as well as to categorically exempt this project from the CEQA requirements. Second. Can we... Other questions? Uh, just uh, could we, we have a friendly amendment to ask staff to explore the, uh, the, whether the sidewalk should be there for one thing um, and the p possibility of um, just have them look at see if those two trees could be preserved. Okay. <laughs> Ryan, you get so many friends in the tree-hugging community. <laughs> I always, <laughs> well, I, uh, to, to the question, has staff, does staff feel that they've exhausted all efforts to be able to do that uh, to get to this alternate layout? Uh, we can definitely work with Public Works on the sidewalk DG path. Um, we will see if there's anything we can do about tree eight. Um, like I said, this does have to come back to council one more time for the final map. So we can, if you would like, add a condition that we will work on see if there's anything we can do about both those items before we bring it back for the final map. All right, I, I, I would so amend the motion to have that as you explained there. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Eric? Eric? <laughs> Eric? Eric? <laughs> I, had, I had just one more comment. And it's, so I'm, I'm very pleased with the, the motion and with staffs working on this. Um, I will point out, I, you know, I, it did not a printout and I don't have it on the screen, but I have it on, on my, my, uh, my iPad right here. But an aerial, just a point, um, an aerial of the city of San Dimas, if you look at the, this area around Gladstone to the 210 freeway and all the way from east to the 57 freeway, shows a great band of oak woodland that just goes along um, the base of those, the hill, basically that that rise that goes from like up in, near Foothill and um, and and the 210 freeway where in Laverne there, and uh, it's just a wonderful natural uh, oak woodland. It's not very thick, but it's still there, and these trees are part of it. So it's really great to be able to preserve as much as we can of that natural landscape. I, I have a clarifying question. You did me dirty once on a motion like this where I included trees on a project on Walnut and you voted against it after I included your amendment. So are you going to support the motion? I love the motion. Thank All you, right. Ryan. Yeah, just click because I will call it back an amendment in a heartbeat if we're not going to get through it. So, All right. Very well. 
All right. We have a motion. And do we have a second? Mm -hmm. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 5 0. Good job. Nice. Staff, Look at that. good job. Okay. Do we need the resolution? No? Okay. According to the city attorney, he says no. Okay. Oral communications. Members of the audience, speakers are limited to three minutes or as may be determined by the, by the chair. Anyone wishing to speak to the council at this time? Seeing none, we'll move forward. City manager's report. Just a reminder that uh, the city attorney will be doing a housing laws presentation on Tuesday, March 28th at a special session that starts at 530 here at City Hall right before the um, council meeting. And you'll send out a calendar reminder? Uh, the calendar reminder has already been sent out to all the council members. Uh, we will ensure that uh, through the city clerk we send that out to all the commissioners so that if they want to attend they're able to attend that study session. Um, I already provided a natural gas update. Thank you to the request to do it up front so the public could hear this. Um, Assistant City Manager Brad McKinney and I attended the City Manager's Conference last week with more than 300 attendees from California cities. I participated in a panel discussion on small city succession planning, creating a culture of growth um, with the city managers of Pismo Beach and Imperial Beach. And as you remember, one of your top priorities for me at the beginning when I was first hired was to start looking at succession planning and ensuring that we start building the bench for folks so we have depth in different key positions. Our city was invited by the California JPIA uh, to participate in this presentation in recognition of the good work we are doing to develop staff, staff for the next step. So I think we're being successful in making movement towards that succession planning. Additionally, the talk of the town at the conference was a proposition that qualified for the 2024 ballot that would severely restrict city's ability to increase fees and charges and impact our, our ability to do that without a public vote. Cal Cities has requested cities provide a recommendation letter for opposition to that proposed ballot measure, and we anticipate placing that on the agenda at one of the next uh, two meetings for the council's consideration. Lastly, I wanted to wish everybody a very happy Valentine's Day that we spent it here and not with our significant others. I am sure they're all very happy that we are doing the public's work instead of being at home on such a special day. And I'd like to extend that Valentine's to my daughter, Anastasia, since I'm not spending it with her. So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, thank you. City Attorney. Uh, well, Chris stole my thunder, Mayor. I was just going to remind everyone that the new housing law study session is on March 28th, 530 here at City Hall. That's all. Members of the City Council Council reports on meetings attended at the expense of the local agency. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I attended the League of California Cities, the new mayors and new council members academy. Uh, it was, uh, I believe it was last week, all my dates are, are slipping out. It was actually um, two weeks ago. Uh, I, the sessions were fantastic. It was over at the Universal uh, City Sheraton. Uh, the session that I found most interesting was the finance session. So got a lot of it. Got took some notes and was also uh, able to take away some of their handouts. So consider it a worthwhile investment uh, for any member of the council to participate in. You learn something new, even though it was aimed at new, uh, newly elected officials. Thank you. Any anything further? Okay. And general comments or just regarding? Not uh, yet. Okay. Not yet. You may be first, though. So okay. Be prepared. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Public Facilities Finance Corporation Authority Officer, City Clerk. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, at the December 13th, 2022 Sandimus Public Facilities Finance Corporation meeting, 
Mayor Pro Tem Ebner was appointed secretary and treasurer. However, the appointment for vice president was missed. So at this meeting, we do need to appoint a vice president. I'm listening. And, and also, Mayor, according to the bylaws, the vice pre yeah, the vice president shall be the mayor pro tem. So the mayor pro tem can be both. If, so that would be Councilmember Ebner, who would be the vice president. <clears throat> the council has already appointed him to be the secretary treasurer, and that would be okay for him to hold both positions. If that I, was the council. I, I will willingly resign that secretary treasurer position even earlier than my term is expiring. So. <laughs> If anybody wants to take it, it doesn't well, sound like it can also be like the he, city manager as well. And I think, I oh, think historically it has it, been the city manager. Yeah, I'll, I would move uh, looking at the minutes that the we realign those positions that the mayor becomes the president, uh, council member Ebner becomes the vice president, and the city manager on his computer taking notes becomes the secretary and treasurer. Second. Wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any, any further? No. Motion. Uh, motion. Second. Vienna. Any other, any further? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, um, I, I guess the president is uh, the mayor, vice president is uh, pro, the pro tem, and the city manager is the secretary treasurer. Everybody okay? All right. City council will request for future items, uh, comments and updates. Eric Weber. Oh, it was the wrong Eric that went first. <laughs> I'm not gonna hold everybody up any longer, so I'm just gonna say happy Valentine's Day to everybody and uh, leave it at that. No, John. <laughs> this is great. It's like we're, we're the infield on the uh, the baseball team, so it looks like it's shortstop to second. Um, just two things. I'll try to be brief. Um, one is that um, the mayor and I attended uh, this summit symposium, whatever you want to call it, uh, at the Suchi um, campus last Wednesday. It was put on by the San Gabriel Valley Consortium on Homelessness and Housing, and, uh, or may end with homelessness, but this was the housing summit. And there were about, from what somebody said, 250 people attending. And uh, the focus was chiefly on affordable housing. There was uh, some on homelessness as well. But I thought it was, there were a lot, I won't go into a lot of the things that were talked about, but there were a lot, a lot of people that knew for people who knew a lot about uh, especially affordable housing that made presentations and I think there was a lot of good information. This is obviously a, a very important issue. I will say that um, one, one, one thing I took away was that the affordable housing folks talked a lot about how, how to make affordable housing and they were talking mainly about densification, number one, and going up, number two. And in one of the breakout sessions, I asked about this, the person who was you know, talking about this. I'm sure we've all gotten calls from residents who are, for one reason or another, having to move, being evicted, or uh, just can't afford the, the rent, or for whatever reason, uh, they're getting older, whatever it is, they want to move from their single family home that's affordable, and it's got a little yard, they want to move to another single family home. And so while the person who was talking lives in Silver Lake and has a home and with a yard and everything else, she was talking about people who can't afford things all living in apartments. Now a lot of people want to live in apartments, I've got nothing, there's nothing about that. But she could not answer what happens to those folks who are on that, they're not going to be homeless, but they're just on the edge of of what they would like to do, which is to live in a single family home on a small piece of property. And one of the gaps in the affordable housing conversation is those kind of houses, of which we have many in San Dimas, and like I say, gotten calls and worked with people 
who are concerned in having to leave. So that was one thing that was interesting and there's a lot of other information about it. And as I said, the mayor and I were there for that. Um, the only other thing is that we've got the downtown specific plan is still moving along and there is another downtown specific plan public workshop coming up um, not this Thursday but next Thursday, February 23rd, 6 o'clock. Um, it's right here in the Senior Center, I believe. And so that's worth coming to because talking about all those higher rise buildings and what we're going to allow and all that um, and how the downtown's going to look, then uh, that's all taken place and going to be determined by the downtown specific plan. So it's worth coming to. Um, it's on the city's calendar, city's website, but it's Thursday the 23rd at 6 o'clock. That's it. Thank you. Mr. DeConnell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say three things. Uh, first, uh, as you know, um, we've been in discussion about Rachel Ramos, who is a mother who had her son uh, gunned down a few years ago in the city. Uh, she has maintained a shrine to her son, which was removed by city officials. When I called her, she was looking for some sort of accommodation, uh, and we talked about reasonableness. Uh, and so one of the things that we thought could be reasonable would be for her to have a period of time around two holidays, both the Christmas holiday as well as Dia de los Muertos, for a short period of time to be able to set up a shrine to her son uh, and honor his memory. Uh, so what I would like to do is ask that we add that to the agenda with the intention of giving staff direction to come up with reasonable guidelines that could accommodate her request uh, for the next meeting. Just to understand your request um it's specific to this family mm -hmm. you're not looking for a broader discussion um because i can think of a few murders unfortunately yep. that have occurred in this city since i've been elected yep i think it so i think it begs the question that if you do open it up to this it does raise those other things uh we're not seeing uh at least i haven't seen other family members do this. I think there's one uh, on, I want to say, Kuvina Boulevard or something like that near the freeway entrance 57. But uh, I, um, I think that exploring the options available to allow residents who have lost a family member to honor them for a short period of time, what those guidelines could be, is something that I'd like to discuss with the council. And I don't, I don't think it's designed strictly for murders. I think you have traffic accidents, traffic fatalities. People are looking for this way to uh, remember their loved ones. But the reality is, you know, what what is a significant showing? Well, so the, the intention is to talk about what would be reasonable, right? Because I think that right now it's, it's all ad hoc. Um, in her case, she was able to set up a shrine, if you will, or memorial for an extended period of time over multiple years, and then this year, changed for whatever reason. So there's nothing in place at all that provides guidance for things like this. And so I do think it's worth coming up with, are there accommodations, is there an application process, do we allow this at all, uh, you know, in, in this situation? And we would want to discuss this and maybe codify it so that way there's an expectation with residents who, should we allow something like this, they understand what those parameters are. I support having that discussion, Eric. Now. So I support it, support it, whatever you're going to say next, but when did you, did you want to have this at the very next meeting or the staff we have, have, a, we'd have to, I think we'd have to talk about it and then provide direction for staff on, on what, what we would want them to look at, right? We can't, we can't discuss that in the open right so now. So is that the kind of thing? That's be added to the agenda. Added to the agenda right? and there wouldn't be any staff report at this next at this meeting you're talking about? I don't about. think so. I think we need to just talk about, talk about it and it, give it, direction. To give them direction to do it. To look into it at that <coughs> point. That's okay. right. Yeah, I, well, I do support it. Okay. Is this uh, something we could do perhaps at a study session coming up? Do we have one coming up? We, we do. We, we have the housing one on the 28th. Um, I believe we have the boarding commission one on the first meeting in March. And I don't recall if we had one for the 28th. Do we have a study session, Deborah, for... That's March 20th, not February. Do you want it at a... Would that be in that governance... That, when is the governance manual thing? That's the first meeting in March. 
Well, I, I wonder, and I know it's there's a time element to this. I mean, is this something that we could have a, a 30 minute study session before a council meeting and hash out? I'm, I'm, I think that there's, it's a delicate topic and I think there's a lot that goes into this. Um, I understand the situation that he's laying out, but I think if we're gonna have a much broader policy discussion, which it sounds like it evolved into, um, then I think there's probably a lot more time right. that might go into that. Uh, yeah, I think there's a time, place, manner conversation that needs to occur it, because initially it wasn't specific to the one individual and then was just, it is a general policy discussion and I think it would apply to encroachment permits that we're allowing on the public right of way. And we have received other requests for um, these kind of recognitions inside city parks and other areas. So I don't know how far the discussion may go. It seems that the, uh, the first discussion won't solve all the, it's basically going to give staff thoughts on what the council's thinking and then the study session, the study session would be good if we had a little bit of information and some ideas from staff on, you know, I want, some of the ideas. I want, I don't, I guess, for, and, and I'm supportive of the discussion, so I don't have an issue with having the discussion. I just, I wonder, one is I, I would hope there's reasonableness in the staff to accommodate these things when they happen around the times that they happen. Um, understanding like the anniversaries of significant dates but on the other hand the broader policy discussion I think is something else and uh, so if there is something coming up that's timely I would hope that staffs being reasonable towards that. We, I, I think the issue here was what was erected was very extensive and it wasn't removed immediately and nobody could be contacted with regards to whose is this installation I think we've seen smaller memorials that have popped up around the city that are not just removed immediately. If, I, the last one I remember is the Lone Hill murder of the individual there. That we actually worked with the family as to when and how to dispose of what was there so that it's done in a respectful manner. And so I think if something came up and there was a timing issue between the discussion, it would be something staff would be discussing. So, so long as it's not something that is intrusive, impactful, there is some leeway in, in regards to that. You know, on, on, on Via Verde, up by the Vaughn Shopping Center, there is a, we had a, a young lady in the wee hours of the morning uh, involved in a fatal traffic accident. And uh, there's a, a bou bouquet of flowers right at the base of the tree. And it's n no bigger than this, but it's there. And the people see it. And, and I've had lots of people ask me how long the city's gonna let it stay. But I've had also the same amount of people saying it's not bothering anybody. Yeah. So this, like, this is a, a major conversation that we need to talk about. We're just getting into a little bit of too much of a discussion on a topic that's not on the agenda. So we just need to know, study session or regular agenda item? Do you want it to come back? What's, what's going to be the fastest way to be able to get it to in case there is an upcoming we, situation. It, if you want to, we can agendize it as a study session at the next meeting. It doesn't necessarily mean there's gonna be a lot of detail on an agenda report for it, but you can have that conversation and give parameters. I mean, that's enough to get the ball rolling, right? So that, I mean, well, you can come back with a policy later, but at least you can get direction from council on how to handle what's coming up. <laughs> All right, that, that, worked? that works, let's do it. Works okay. So the study session, the next council meeting, half hour, 45 minutes or so? We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it. Okay. The timing, and the, I think the, the uh, Rachel did want to attend whatever that is. So we probably want to work with her on scheduling just to make sure that she's present because she did express strongly that she wanted to have a point of view shared. Uh, understood, but it, we, I, have, I have to I premise understand. it on the discussion the council has. And so if I say 30 minutes and you can't get it done in 30 minutes, then it really run into problems, but yeah, absolutely. Okay. Council member, can you send me her contact information? Yes, I can get that for you. 
Okay. And then the last two items that I had were uh, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. And I also want to extend my heartfelt thanks to my colleagues who joined me on a Saturday morning to propose improvements to the commissions. I felt the discussion was productive uh, and respectful. Uh, and it was a treat to spend an early morning Saturday with all of you for, what was it, six hours or something like that? And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ryan. All right, thank you. Um, one is, uh, as uh, Council Member Nakano shared, we did have a fun session reviewing our boards, committees, and commissions handbooks, um, version two, I think, uh, in the last <laughs> couple years. Uh, I applaud staff for the time uh, it took to put all that together. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, as Eric uh, shared, there was some good uh, discussion. Um, and I think ultimately we'll end up at a, a better place uh, in terms of governance and, and where we're taking the city from that. Um, one thing I'd like uh, is for staff, and I'm sure you're going to, but uh, just to be able to have said it, I hope that we will work with Charter Oak uh, Mobile Home Estates uh, to address the concerns that were raised tonight. Um, I think that you know, this is a very challenging matter. It's been challenging, uh, it continues to be challenging. I am a little concerned over some of the things that I heard uh, tonight as it relates to um, the transference uh, from one provider to another um, and some of the issues that are coming up, but uh, I trust staff will look into that and uh, act accordingly. Um, I would hope uh, and I would seek support from my fellow council members uh, to have staff prepare a letter to be brought to the next meeting, uh, to be sent to the CPUC, uh, as well as to Senator Portantino, uh, as well as Assemblymember Chris Holden expressing concern uh, over the outrageous uh, gas price spike that uh, we've seen um, and request some sort of relief uh, be uh, appropriated uh, from the state. I understand the governor's calling for investigations and all of that stuff, but that doesn't help our people right now. Um, and I think that we need to raise our voice on this issue because that issue is not just impacting um, one or two people. I mean, that literally is impacting all of us. And I don't know if you saw your gas bill, but I did. I almost fell out of my chair. So, um, I don't know if there's any support for that. Uh, any gas customer subscribers here represented? Yeah. Maybe I'm the only one. Oh. I would be interested. Oh, all right. Cool. <laughs> okay. So um, I think, uh, staff, if you can follow the tenor of that, at least express concern uh, related to that, and the council can review that uh, perhaps at the next meeting. You know, I, I, I know it's Southern California gas, but I also know that uh, Congresswoman uh, Napoliano is putting together something in the same light. So maybe our letter should also be addressed to her. Perfect, yeah. So state and federal officials uh, coupled with the CPUC. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and then I had the opportunity to attend a couple interesting things over the last couple of weeks. Um, the University of Southern California uh, put on a uh, avoided, Avoiding Cannabis Chaos uh, event that was put on from uh, the Price School of Public Policy uh, as well as uh, with former Sheriff Jim McDonnell, a few others. Um, and it's interesting, I think the city uh, made a lot of right decisions as it relates to cannabis uh, in the city. I think that, um, you know, cities have not realized some of the revenues that they thought they were going to realize. Uh, there's a lot of challenges with regulation, um, and there's a lot of challenges even with the market that further went under and became more lucrative uh, and, frankly, uh, appears to have uh, heightened potency in some of their products, uh, which seem to be selling. So um, I am happy uh, with the direction that the city council took uh, when it did as it related to this particular matter uh, and the direction that it's continued to take as it relates to this matter. The other thing is I had the opportunity to attend uh, a town hall uh, on gun violence uh, put on by uh, safety and trauma put on by Senator Portantino. Uh, some of the speakers uh, included uh, Sheriff Luna as well as uh, some other uh, folks um, who are some experts in the field. Uh, I think it's important in the wake of Monterey Park that everyone is mindful uh, of not just their surroundings, but mindful of mental health, mindful of uh, weapons and 
do their due diligence as it relates to gun safety. Um, if you're someone who owns a firearm, uh, I really implore you to take a gun uh, safety class if you have not, um, and really do your part to store uh, weapons accordingly, and also to seek services if you're someone who's experienced trauma uh, and you're struggling with that trauma. Uh, it's really important that people do that. And as I said, I think at the last council meeting, 988 uh, was launched, I think, in June of last year as an alternative crisis response model. Uh, you can call that. That line is staffed by Dee Dee Hirsch. And I think that's something that uh, is a great resource for someone if, you're, if, you, if you or someone you know is in a moment of crisis uh, or in need of services. Uh, please use those resources. They are out there. They are funded. Um, and alternative crisis response does not necessarily mean that a sheriff's deputy is going to show up at your home. Um, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, it looks to have non-uniform personnel respond, uh, and that can be someone with lived experience. That could be a licensed clinical social worker, or psychologist, or otherwise. So um, bottom line is uh, there's a lot of things going on in the world today, but it's very important uh, that people are mindful of those things. And lastly, uh, if you're celebrating Singles Awareness Day, I hope you had an outstanding day today. Uh, at least that's what we used to call it when I wasn't married. And now that I am married, happy Valentine's Day uh, to everyone. I hope you have a warm and loving day. And, uh, you know, as Councilmember Nakano greeted us, all of us, earlier, uh, I definitely want to be home with my wife, but you guys are the t closest second to where I wanted to be tonight, and uh, I very much enjoyed tonight. Thank you. I would point out there's five of us and one of your wives, so I feel like would be equal, oh. right? <laughs> Get a five for one deal there, and plus the staff. I don't know about that. You know, as uh, John mentioned, I, I, I also attended the, the homeless uh, symposium. Uh, it's interesting, there were, it was a, a full house about 250, 300 people. And they were all, you know, either council members or folks from to deal with our staffs and, and things like that. But the people that are kind of coordinating it seem to be pretty sharp and, and they, uh, they know what they're doing. And uh, they're open to us sitting down and talking with them. And I thought that that was good. Um, they talked about all kinds of things. They talked about eight foot houses to multi-story buildings. And uh, I don't think we have that many multi-story buildings to be worried about, but they talked about eight, those eight foot houses. And you know, if you remember, there was a while back, there was some discussion of, about that property over by, uh, off of Pony Express. Uh, so I don't, I don't know, there's nothing in our world right now that we're looking at it like, like that, but there are people out there that are looking for it, for those type of, opportunities and this was up at the sushi they have become just a fabulous partner in the city of san dimas i also attended the set following saturday a uh, clay ex exposition there okay and i didn't know what i was going to but i gave uh you know the opening remarks and then i f you know then we, we figured out what it was all about and it was some of the prettiest you know, clay f fabrications that I've ever seen. So I, I said, what is this all, you know, what's, what's the meaning of this? And these people worldwide have this clay exposition and every dime of this last week's money is going to Turkey and the, to uh, Syria for their um, earthquake uh, problems that they have there. I thought that was pretty good. They were one of the first, first organizations on the ground there. Uh, we're very fortunate that the United States headquarters is located here in San Dimas. And uh, they have a, a spunky lady uh, named Deborah who just, you know, she's all over the world. And uh, I just want to say thank you to them for uh, representing their organization. But she makes it very clear she also is a partner here in San Dimas. And then the last thing I want to say is that two things is about uh, Bonita School District. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, 
Chris and I attended uh, a, uh, an appointment gathering that they had to appoint Matt Wayne as the new superintendent of schools. Uh, he's been around the district for quite some time. Uh, seems to be a very open person, so if you need to contact him, I think you just get a hold of his secretary, I believe Margaret McDonald, and uh, yeah, he, you know they'll reach back out to you. And the other thing is a little sad, but um, tonight, uh, San Dimas High School had the third round of CIF basketball, and uh, I'm fortunate, I hate to report that they were defeated by some other school called Benita, Benita High School at 59-58. <laughs> so it was a pretty close game, but I, I attended um, several of their games, you know, um, and it's, it's interesting to see these kids really, really work hard. So that's, that's, that's really about it. Uh, happy Valentine's Day or whatever's left of it. Um, I think we'll, uh, we're gonna close in memory of, of Steve Rudy. Do we have anything additional to say? And anyone here representing Steve? Okay. All right, we're gonna close the meeting. Mr. And Mayor, could I just say, uh, sure. I, I knew Mr. Rudy and um, you know, for those that didn't know, he owned uh, Starberry Farms up off of Foothill near Walnut. And um, I remember going there growing up, we'd always run across the street. Um, well, not run across the street, but we'd walk across the street uh, to go uh, get gummy bears, funny enough. My dad one time got sick from some of those gummy bears. He had too much carnauba wax. But anyways, the point is uh, Steve was an outstanding person uh, if you had the opportunity to meet him um, just a, a guy full of life and um, he was very much in tune with what was going on with our community especially as a small business owner who lived in the area so um, needless to say uh, he's going to be missed uh, my neighbors um, uh, were there the night uh, he, he passed uh, and so um, very close to home um, at least for me quite literally but uh, anyways, he'll be missed, and I'm happy to hear it. Sounds like the family is going to continue uh, having Starberry Farms operate um, in his memory, and I think that's awesome. And uh, they're awesome members of the community. So thank you. Yeah, I believe they opened up this week. So uh, uh, he will be missed. All right. We'll adjourn till the next what meeting. Council, next council meeting. Earlier, though. Probably 5.30, 6 o'clock.